Hey guys, make sure to like and subscribe, any support from y'all is appreciated. If you want me to post a specific manga or novel leave a comment and I'll try my best. If the video is too fast or slow for your liking then you can adjust it in the right corner of the video. My current goal is to hit 500 subscribers. Standing above Castor's corpse, Sonny tilted his head slightly. Despite his expectations, there was not a lot of joy in his heart. Instead, defeating the powerful scion of a true legacy clan left him feeling somber, and a little bitter. There was, however, a sense of, if not validation, then at least vindication. It was as though some profound need in his soul was finally satisfied, making it more solid. Steady. With a pain groan, Sonny took a step back, turned around, and dismissed the weaver's mask. He was in better shape than he had expected to be. Countless cuts on his body were painful, but not dangerous. Bloodweave was diligently doing its job, preventing him from losing too much of the precious red liquid. The cuts were already starting to scab over and close. The only serious wound was the gash on his side, but it, too, had already stopped bleeding. Very soon, it was going to start healing, too. Until then, it was not going to hinder his movements a lot, as long as Sonny was ready to endure a bit of suffering. After a year on the forgotten shore, dealing with pain was one of his best trained skills. I've been through worse, much worse, this is nothing. Then, another thought entered his mind. That shadow fragment. It should have brought me to a thousand, right? A moment later, he realized that his whole being was somehow weird. It felt as though there was intense heat in his chest, slowly growing more and more scalding. This sensation was not exactly physical, but more of a spiritual one. Like the core of his soul was undergoing a violent change. With a mix of anticipation and dread, Sonny concentrated on this feeling. Here we go. What was going to happen to him? Suddenly, he heard the voice of the spell again. In the eerie expanse of the Crimson Spare, where ancient darkness fused with otherworldly light, it sounded solemn and almost triumphant. Your shadow is overflowing with power. Sonny listened tensely, trying to guess what was it going to say next. Your shadow is taking shape. In the next moment, he staggered and fell to his knees. His eyes widened and lost focus. The heat that was building up in Sonny's soul had reached a critical point, and then exploded. It felt as though his core was being torn apart, drowning him with intense, indescribable pain. Disoriented and frightened, he tried to scream, but no sound came out of his mouth. Something was emerging from within his soul, ripping it into shreds. Sonny knew that he couldn't stop that process, and so, all he could do was endure. As Sonny convulsed on the ground, the spell whispered. Your shadow is complete. And then, something strange happened. The spell was about to say something else, but then the entire crimson spire suddenly shuddered. This quake was much stronger than all the previous ones, making it feel as though the gargantuan structure was about to topple. Sonny heard the deafening sound of breaking stone. Almost at the same time, he was suddenly enveloped in absolute darkness, all light disappearing from the echoing interior of the ancient tower, and the spell abruptly fell quiet, its last proclamation left unsaid. The pain tearing his soul apart was also gone. It didn't feel as though the process was finished, though, it felt as though it was interrupted. Wah! What is happening? Confused and disoriented, Sonny looked around. Why was it so dark? Following a premonition, he then raised his head and glanced up. Dot 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 what? The furious light of the crimson terror was gone. As Sonny tried to wrap his head around this fact, two things registered in his mind. The first one was that he felt very strange. His chest was still full of ethereal heat, but there was also something else. Some kind of interference? He was having trouble finding words to describe that sensation, but knew that it wasn't harmful at least not immediately. The second one was that. Crap. The second thing he noticed was that, currently, there were giant slabs of stone plunging down on his head. Picking himself up from the ground, Sonny dashed to the edge of the wide root and jumped off of it. Just a second later, one of the slabs crushed into the coral, turning it into dust. A violent shockwave hit him in the back. The prowling thorn was currently restoring itself in the soul sea, its invisible string cut by Castor's enchanted gen. So, for a moment, Sonny found himself in free fall. Then, the transparent blur of the dark wing finally weaved itself from sparks of light on his back and allowed him to glide forward, following the momentum of the jump. As he reached the wall of the spire, another deafening crash resounded from behind. Looking up and at the descending mass of broken stone, Sonny thrust the moonlight shard forward. The tip of the fallen memory easily sunk into the ancient granite, giving him purchase. Hanging on it, he pressed himself against the cold stones and gritted his teeth, waiting for the avalanche of debris to pass and praying that nothing hits him. A few moments later, the spire shuddered again, and then grew still. Somewhere down below, destruction was still raining on the interior of the spire, but this high, it was relatively quiet. Sonny opened his eyes. He was still alive. 
The dome of the crimson spire seemed to be broken, letting in beautiful sunshine. The darkness was not as impenetrable now, suffused with that light. Dust particles floated in the air, sparkling like tiny diamonds. Sunlight. Sunlight? Panicking, Sonny looked around, searching for shelter. But then noticed that his shadow was utterly calm. Unlike before, when his soul was being destroyed by the artificial sun, it wasn't doing anything. It did seem a bit confused, though, what the hell is going on? Perplexed, Sonny decided to make absolutely sure that the annihilating power of the terror was gone from the rays of sunshine and dove into the soul sea. What he saw there shocked him so much that he almost let go of the hilt of the moonlight shard and fell down. The entire landscape of the tranquil sea was changed. If before there was nothing but darkness, now, it was filled with blinding white light. The light flowed through Sonny's soul, making the silent waters ripple and swirl. Up above, the black sphere of the shadow core was burning with furious flames. It trembled and seethed, as though overflowing with power. However, that power was being suppressed by the current of light, which prevented it from spreading outward. Beneath it, there was a massive whirlpool. Stunned, Sonny stared at the unrecognizable expanse of his soul and didn't know how to react. What the hell is this? Full of unease and dark thoughts, he hesitated for a bit and then summoned the runes. Everything was the same as the last time he had glanced at them, except for one line. Shadow fragments, one thousand one thousandths. Not, not everything. In the cluster of runes describing his attributes, a few new ones appeared. Concentrating on them, Sonny held his breath and read. Attribute, soul conduit, soul conduit. The attribute had no description, nor was its acquisition announced by the spell. Staring at the runes for a few more seconds, Sonny cast one last glance at the white void of his soul sea and left it. He had no answers for this mysterious sequence of events, but his intuition was ringing the alarm bell. He was almost sure that the strange and painful process that began after he had absorbed the last shadow fragment was somehow interrupted. The white light permeating the soul sea felt unnatural. And wrong, like something external to it rather than natural. The mysterious new attribute was most likely connected to this external influence instead of to the saturation of the shadow core. In fact, soul conduit, was most likely the manifestation of the radiant force that was currently suppressing the core. In that sense, this attribute was more akin to the mind hex of the soul devourer than to the blood weave. It wasn't something that Sonny had achieved or acquired. It was forced upon him, for reasons yet unknown. Gritting his teeth, Sonny shifted and changed his grip on the handle of the moonlight shard. Then, he summoned the ordinary rock and immediately dismissed it. Finally, he ordered the shadow to wrap itself around his body, then shift to the ghostly stiletto and back. At least the new attribute did not seem to be directly harmful. Sonny was still in control of his body and mind, as well as having full access to his memories and shadow control. All it seemed to be affecting was the shadow core itself, preventing it from... from achieving whatever it was that had failed to happen, at least for now. But how long would that safety last? Raising his head, Sonny stared at the pinnacle of the Crimson Spire. Something unexplainable had transpired there, causing this strange turn of events. Why was he trying to guess if all the answers were most likely waiting for him up above? To his side, a massive slab of stone had lodged itself between stumps of broken coral roots. More debris piled on top of it at steep angles, forming a twisting path to the distant sunlight. Pushing himself off the wall of the tower, Sonny glided forward and landed on the inclined stone surface. Then, he lingered for a few moments and began climbing up. The higher he ascended, the more sunshine surrounded him. Eventually, the whole tower was filled with nothing but stark beams of light and deep, dark shadows. The world was black and white, as though no other color was allowed into this solemn space. After a while, Sonny approached the broken dome of the Crimson Spire. There, a vast hall was hidden in the darkness, both its floor and roof now shattered, letting in the brightness of the sun. With a deep sigh, Sonny reached with his hands and pulled himself into the hall. He was now at the very pinnacle of the Crimson Spire in the lair of the terror of the forgotten shore. At the very tip of the ancient tower, there was once a vast and beautiful chamber. It seemed as though it had a large circular opening in its center, allowing sunlight to easily flow into the gargantuan structure at high noon. Then, however, that opening had become overgrown by crimson coral. And now it was gone. Due to something that had happened during Changing Star's battle against the terror, the floor of the chamber partially collapsed, bringing the coral down with it. The ceiling was damaged too, although to a lesser extent. Through the chasm in the spire's roof, Sonny could see the boundless white skies and the burning orb of the artificial sun. Lingering at it for a moment, he then lowered his gaze and looked at the chamber itself. The first thing he saw was Nephis, who was sitting on the floor, staring into the distance. Although her state was not as terrifying as on that terrible night when a dweller of the depths had pulled her beneath the waves of the cursed sea, she did not look too good. The Starlight Legion Armier was practically destroyed, 
revealing gruesome burns and cuts on her ivory skin. Just like then, white flames were seeping out of them instead of blood. These fires seemed strangely weak, though, as though on the verge of being extinguished. They were also failing to mend her mangled flesh. Neff's wounds appeared to be healing, but at a very slow pace, a far cry from the miraculous restoration that Sunny had witnessed so many times in the past. The furious power that had always burned deep within her soul seemed to be finally exhausted. Almost. Following her gaze, Sunny shuddered when he saw the terror. The creature that had created the forgotten shore might have looked as a human once, but now, it was like a feverish nightmare. For some reason, Sunny had expected to see the familiar shape of the nameless goddess, whose statue was created in the likeness of the girl that had been made into the vessel of the artificial sun. What met him instead was a giant creature whose body was made out of a perverse fusion of crimson coral and mutilated human flesh. In a sense, it was similar to the crimson golems he had fought at the base of the spire. It was a twisted approximation of a living being, one that radiated a horrifying sense of madness, wrongness, and loss. Instead of a human face, the terror had hundreds of them, all contorted in expressions of blind agony and suffering. Their mouths were open, as though straining to scream. Their eyes were empty wells of pure darkness. At least now, they were. When the terror was alive, they must have shone with blinding, annihilating light. And it was, unmistakably, dead. The harrowing creature was sprawled on the floor, its limbs unmoving, its body fractured almost in half. The edges of the terrible wound were burned and melted, leaving no doubt that it was dealt by changing star's incandescent silver blade. How? How is this possible? Stunned, Sonny stared at the vanquished terror, failing to comprehend what he saw. How could Neff kill a fallen terror? No matter how powerful she was, she was still a sleeper. Even with the tremendous augmentation of the Dawn Shard, she should not have been capable of slaying something this powerful. Something was very wrong here. This doesn't make sense. But then again, this wouldn't be the first terror Nephis had slain. Changing Star had killed one in her first nightmare, two, earning her that name. Still, there was a vast difference between a dormant human killing an awakened terror and a fallen one. One feat was impossible. The other? The other was simply unthinkable. Turning to her, Sunny hesitated and then said in disbelief, You. You actually killed it. Neff flinched, as though noticing his presence for the first time. Then, she slowly turned her head and looked at him with empty, lost eyes. Only after a few seconds, a hint of recognition appeared in them. She remained silent for a while, and then said in a hollow voice, Sonny, you are finally here. He hesitated for a few moments, not sure how to answer. As seconds passed by, the silence between them grew tense, full of untold meaning. Finally, Nephis blinked and looked away, staring at the corpse of the Crimson Terror, her sword hand trembling slightly. Killed it? Yes. I did. Got lucky, I guess. After a while, she added in a quiet voice. It was just a fake star. In the end, Sonny smiled slightly, but his eyes remained cold. Lucky. I know a thing or two about being lucky, Neff. A creature like this would not have died just because of bad luck. She remained silent for a bit, then sighed and looked down. It was evolving. Trying to become a titan. The burden of transformation made it vulnerable. I just happened to attack while the terror was at its weakest. That's why it died. Evolving. Into a titan? Noticing a surprised expression on his face, changing star grimaced and pointed to the artificial sun. Have you not thought about what we have done? Sunny looked up, at the radiant sphere of light, and frowned. In all the chaos, he had indeed forgotten to consider the full scale of what had transpired after the battle, as well as the reasons for and consequences of it. Come to think of it. Why would the light of the artificial sun destroy the souls of every living creature it touched? It had not been like this before the fall of the ancient civilization, for many generations, at least. But then, the vessel had become corrupted and turned into a nightmare creature, the terror. And at the same time, the seals imprisoning the curse of the all-consuming darkness had been destroyed, letting it free. So, in fact, the corrupted sun had never existed without the dark sea keeping it company. Until today, Sunny had always thought that the sun was restraining the dark sea. Could it be? That it had always been restrained by the darkness, as well, and when he banished the ancient curse and locked it underground. The sun was finally liberated from its shackles. That's why its light suddenly changed, turning into the annihilating white radiance. It had become free to do whatever it wanted. But there was something else. As his eyes widened, Nephis nodded. Yes. The artificial sun does not just illuminate the vicinity of the crimson spire. It illuminates the whole of the forgotten shore. Its light reaches everywhere. So, as we were fighting our way through the tower. Most of the living creatures on the forgotten shore had been wiped out. All that death, all those countless souls. Guided into the spire by the labyrinth, like a colossal hecatomb, to fuel the evolution of the Crimson Terror. 
and Nephis just happened to attack while the terror was in the throes of that terrifying transformation. Well, that wasn't a coincidence, most likely. Sunny had not forgotten the thoughtful look on her face as Neff had peered out of the gates of the spire before giving the Dreamer army the command to advance. He shivered, only now realizing that this whole region of the Dream Realm was now almost completely empty of life. Only a few nightmare creatures must have survived. Those who were lucky enough to hide from the deadly sunlight in time, or were powerful enough to resist it. Such a boundless influx of souls would indeed be enough to push the Crimson Terror to the next step of its evolution. Devolution? Whatever it was that happened to nightmare creatures as they grew more powerful. Not that Sunny knew anything about this matters, but if anything could cause something like that, then the evisceration of an entire region of the Dream Realm would certainly do the trick. Now, however, the terror was dead, and its corrupting influence was gone, turning the artificial sun back to its normal self. It couldn't be that easy, though. As if answering his thoughts, the spire shuddered again. Another slab of stone broke off from the floor of the chamber and plunged down. Suddenly, the light of the sun grew a little bit dimmer. Looking up, Sunny noticed that the artificial sun looked not as bright as it had just a few minutes ago. It was as though it was slowly dying. Was it dying? There was no vessel to channel soul essence into its furnace anymore, after all. Interrupting his thoughts, Nephis suddenly spoke, her voice hoarse and tired. What happened to the others? Sunny shifted and looked down through the chasm in the chamber's floor. Far below, he could see the vast balcony and the shimmering ring of the gateway on it. Somehow, its shine seemed weaker. The balcony, however, was empty. There were no humans there, and even the coral golems lay unmoving, their semblance of life snuffed out when the terror died. Everyone has escaped. Neff sighed slowly, as if with relief. After a long pause, she moved slightly and asked, what about Castor? Sunny glanced at her and shrugged. When he spoke, his voice was cold and indifferent. I killed him. Changing Star remained silent for a long time. Then, she whispered, seemingly addressing no one. So that's why. Suddenly, a bitter laugh escaped from her lips. Nephis raised her hands and pressed them against her face, as if overwhelmed by some deep, dark emotion. After a few seconds, her muffled voice reached his ears. You shouldn't have killed him, Sonny. Sonny snarled. Yeah? Why, exactly? She remained motionless for a few seconds, and then slowly lowered her hands and put them on her knees. Her face was pale and bleak. Have you checked your attributes? He nodded and looked at her with a curious expression. I did. There's a new one there. Soul Conduit. Changing Star stared into the distance and nodded. Yeah. Same for me. Sunny raised his eyebrow and asked, his voice calm and steady. Any idea what it means? She did not say anything for a while, and then turned her head to look at him. Have you not figured it out? He shrugged. I was a bit preoccupied. Why? What is it? Nephis sighed and looked at the walls of the chamber. Finally, she said, this whole tower is a giant soul machine. It was created to collect soul essence and funnel it into the artificial sun. However, it can't function without one small, but crucial gear, a human to serve as the fulcrum of all that power, the conduit for all those souls. And then, in a much quieter voice, she added, the vessel, Sunny shuddered, then stared at the corpse of the repulsive creature, the previous vessel of the artificial sun. Nephis had killed it, destroying a crucial part of the spire's mechanism. And so, the spire found it a replacement, the two of them the only two humans left on the forgotten shore, conveniently hiding from the obliterating sun inside the ancient tower. One would be tempted to say that it was fate. What does it mean for us, exactly? Are we going to turn into something? Like that thing? Neff slowly shook her head. Not yet. Not for a long time. The terror had absorbed most of the souls it had reaped after the battle, and there's no one to make sacrifices to the sun now. The labyrinth, too, is now dead. Echoing her words, the spire trembled once again, and somewhere down below, a deafening sound of crushing stone could be heard. Sonny tilted his head. So what's the problem? Can't we just get the hell out of here and never come back? Changing Star looked at him, her eyes full of cold, bitter emotion. You don't get it, do you? After that, she gritted her teeth and said, the Crimson Spire is a machine, and the gateway is a part of that machine. The spire can't function without a human serving as the sole conduit. And neither can the gateway. There has to be a vessel inside the tower for the gateway to work. She slowly rose to her feet, swayed slightly, and finally pierced him with a dark gaze. Which means that only one of us can escape. Sunny stared at her for a few seconds, then looked down at the distant ring of the gateway. Finally, he turned back to Nephis and said, I don't suppose you'll stay behind and let me go? Changing Star looked at him, her striking gray eyes full of intensity and nascent white flames. I was about to ask you the same. Sunny lingered for a moment, then grinned. Not a chance. Slowly walking away from the edge of the chasm, 
Sonny stopped opposite Nephis and looked at her. In his dark eyes, there was nothing but coldness. Well, it's not like we didn't know for a long time that this would be how things end. Did we? She stared at him for a while, then smiled bitterly. We did. Indeed, they knew. From that terrible day when Sonny had first understood the meaning behind Cassie's vision, he suspected that one day, in order to survive, he would have to kill Nephis. This was the truth he had chosen to hide from, even if it meant losing his mind. The final and most unbearable reason for why he had spent months alone in the dark city, hunting monsters and slowly turning into one of them. How does one come to terms with the knowledge that, one day, they will have to kill the person they care for the most? Knowledge, indeed, was the heaviest thing in the world. Back at the beginning of it all, far away from the dark city, before they had even known that the Crimson Spire existed, Cassie had shared with them a terrible vision. She said, at first, I saw a, a boundless darkness locked behind seven seals. Something vast was churning in the darkness. I felt like if I directly saw it, I would lose my mind. As I watched, terrified, the seals broke one after another, until only one remained. And then that seal broke, too. The first part of her vision described the day when the vessel of the artificial sun had gone mad, and the curse of the all-consuming darkness had escaped the prison created for it by the seven ancient heroes. I saw the human castle again. Only this time, it was at night. There was a lonely star burning in the black skies, and under its light, the castle was suddenly consumed by fire, with rivers of blood flowing down its halls. I saw a corpse in a golden armor sitting on a throne, a woman with a bronze spear drowning in a tide of monsters, an archer trying to pierce the falling sky with his arrows. The lonely star shining in the black skies was Nephis, the herald of ruinous change, who had drowned the halls of the bright castle in blood to become its ruler, and then watched as it burned to the ground. The corpse in the golden armor was Gunlock, who had died on his white throne, killed by her hand. The woman with a bronze spear and the desperate archer were Effie and Kai, who had almost perished fighting against the Nightmare Horde during the Siege of the Crimson Spire. In the end, I saw a colossal, terrifying Crimson Spire. At its base, seven severed heads were guarding seven locks, and at the top, a, a dying angel was being consumed by hungry shadows. When I saw the angel bleed, I suddenly felt as though, as though something so precious that it can't be described with words was taken from me. Seven severed heads guarding seven locks were the heads of the giant statues, who stared at the star sigil that Sunny had used to banish the Dark Sea. And the last part of the prophecy. It wasn't that hard to understand, too. Nephis was the dying angel, the precious thing that was going to be taken from Cassie, and Sunny was the hungry shadow that consumed her. It was their fate. Then, I felt so much sorrow, pain and rage that what little remained of my sanity seemed to disappear. That was when I woke up. I think. This was the last thing Cassie had said. Looking at Nephis, Sunny sighed and turned away. I warned you, didn't I? I told you that this story won't have a happy ending. That there will be only sorrow, pain, and rage. Do you remember what you answered me? These were the words he said on the day Neff had asked him to join her expedition. Back then, his suspicion that they would inevitably end up as enemies had already grown, becoming almost a certainty. Almost. That cursed word. This was the word that had given him hope, no matter how small. Hope that he was wrong. But despite that hope, Sonny had been preparing for this moment for a long, long time. It was because he had known that he would have to face Nephis in combat that he had decided to incorporate Saint's methodical style into his technique, why he trained without rest, day and night, not sparing himself from the pain and hardship. If his only skill was one that she herself had taught him, what chance did he have of defeating her? It was for that reason that he had climbed to the highest point of the hunter's statue and spent a night alone there, stealing himself for the inevitable future forcing himself to accept the terrible truth that, soon, he would have to kill Nephis. It was because of this that he had refused changing Star's offer to heal him. How could he allow her to endure the terrible pain of the white flames, knowing that she would be suffering for the sake of her future killer? And it was because of this that he had not tried to learn all of her secret plans, remaining comfortable in his role as a hired mercenary. An outsider, he had known that, no matter what, they would end up here, in this moment, forced to fight each other. Fate. Fate was a terrifying enemy to fight against. He knew it better than most. Fate always won, in the end. Defeating it was almost impossible. Shifting slightly, Nephis looked at him and answered, her voice strangely wistful. Life is not a story. It only ends when you die. Sunny smiled. So, are you ready to die? As white sparks ignited in the depths of Changing Star's eyes, she answered with another question. What about you? Instead of answering, Sonny summoned the Midnight Shard and raised it, assuming a battle stance. Opposite of him, Nephis did the same, her silver sword weaving itself from blinding light. Of course, neither of them planned to kill the other. They needed the other to remain alive, at least until the victor passed through the gateway. 
How long would the loser survive after that, though? Especially if they were beaten terribly enough to lose the ability to resist further. Staying behind meant death. As the ancient, gargantuan tower quaked around them, balancing on the edge of collapse, lost from light and changing star prepared to cross their blades. Sunny and Nephis looked at each other, the air practically crackling with tension at the point where their gazes met. The white flame seeping from changing star's wounds suddenly flashed in a furious outburst, closing some of her wounds and making others seem less severe. After that, however, it grew weak and disappeared, retreating back into the furnace of her soul. As a pained grimace contorted the young woman's face, a dim radiance then slowly shined from beneath her ivory skin. At the same time, the shadow flowed up and wrapped itself around Sunny's body, making it brim with power and vitality. He inhaled deeply and slightly moved, shifting his weight from one leg to another. How? How can it end? Before the thought could fully form, Sunny ruthlessly destroyed it and banished it from his mind. This was the last obstacle on his way back to the real world. And the most deadly. Sunny had fought many terrible creatures in the cursed hell of the Forgotten Shore, but none of them were as fearsome and dangerous as Changing Star. This was going to be his hardest battle yet. To win it, he had to be absolutely clear, absolutely focused. He couldn't allow himself to feel anything, be distracted by anything. No doubt, no fear, no regret, no compassion, only determination, only resolve, only murderous will to prevail. As dust particles shined in the beams of white light that fell through the broken roof of the ancient chamber. As stark shadows swelled with dark anticipation, Nephis brought the pommel of her sword to her shoulder. White flames ignited in her eyes. And then, suddenly, she lunged forward. Fast. But not fast enough to not give Sunny enough time to react. Raising the midnight shard, he dashed forward to block her furious assault. And shuddered, the force of the impact sending a shock through his entire body. It felt as though his sword had collided with a mountain. Their blades got entangled for a moment, and then separated. Almost immediately, the silver longsword lashed out again, appearing from an unexpected direction. And then again, and again, and again. Sunny feverishly defended, chaining blocks and deflections into one uninterrupted sequence of swift moves. Despite his best efforts, he reeled slightly after each strike. It was as though he was being hit by a hurricane of adamantine sledgehammers, each hit making his bones tremble and groan. How? How is she that strong? How was Nephis so strong? How was she so fast? How was she so resilient? It didn't make sense. By now, Sonny had fully saturated his core, bringing him to the pinnacle of what a human of his rank could achieve in terms of physical ability. His power was further doubled by the augmentation of the shadow, making him more akin to one of the awakened than to a mere sleeper. No dormant human should have been able to match his power in every regard. And yet, Changing Star did. More than that, she was more powerful than him, tremendously so. She was more like a nightmare creature than a human, her movements were fast as lightning, her strength was terrifying, and her technique was flawless, leaving him no chance to exploit even the smallest of mistakes. No sleeper should have been that powerful. It was simply impossible. And yet, somehow, it wasn't. Impossible, impossible. Deflecting another blow, Sonny gritted his teeth and dashed to the side, hoping to exploit the momentary opening in his enemy's defense. However, he was met by the ruthless flash of the silver blade instead. The opening was just a ruse, one which almost cost him his hand. Something is very wrong here. Either the augmentation of the white flame was much more powerful than that of his shadow, or something else was at play. However, Sonny didn't think that the radiance emanating from Neff's skin was stronger than his own physical enhancement. From what he had observed during her battle against Gunlock, it was roughly the same or only slightly more forceful. It shouldn't have given her this big of an advantage, especially in its seemingly exhausted state. Somehow, Nephis had grown much stronger between then and now. But how? At least the silver sword was not burning with the annihilating, incandescent light. If it was, the midnight shard might have already been if not destroyed, then at least severely damaged. In that regard, luck was still on Sunny's side. They exchanged several more blows and disengaged for a fraction of a second, then closed in again. Changing Star's sword shot forward, missing Sonny's face by a few millimeters. Or so he thought before sensing warm drops rolling down his cheek. A thin cut appeared on it, swelling with blood, just a little bit to the right, and he would have lost an eye. Shaken, Sonny deflected the sword away, preventing Nephis from slicing his neck with a reverse cut, and leaned forward in an attempt to ram her with his shoulder. Changing Star easily sidestepped around Sonny and brought her weapon down, forcing him to block from a disadvantageous position and stagger back. Curse it. Their violent clash must have looked furious and morbidly beautiful. Both moved with incredible speed and possessed ferocious strength, both were skilled and experienced, forged into formidable killers by hundreds of deadly battles. 
One was darkness and shadows, while the other was radiance and light. But the true combat was happening somewhere else, invisible to the naked eye. This fight was as much about strategy and insight as it was about physical prowess and technique. After all, to excel as a fighter, one had to master both their body and mind. Nephis might have been unnaturally fast and strong, but what really made her devastatingly deadly was her own battle genius, her incredible level of understanding of the laws and principles of combat. Armed with it, she was able to predict what her enemy was going to do even before they themselves knew it. But that was not all. The scariest thing about Nephis was that, through that understanding, she was even able to manipulate and dictate her opponent's actions, turning them into her puppet. She was in absolute control of the flow of combat. Combat was her domain, just like shadows were his. But Sonny was not a novice, either. He was a master of manipulation, too. But more importantly, he had enough insight and knew Nephis well enough to if not deceive her, then at least not allow her to lure him into an inescapable trap. That was why, for a dozen torturously long seconds, neither of them had been able to seriously wound the other. Even if Sonny was locked into desperate defense and outmatched in every regard, he still managed to hold Changing Star's monstrous onslaught off. At least for now. Finally, the two of them disengaged and stepped back, pausing for a few moments. Sonny was breathing heavily, his bloodied face turning even more pale than usual. Nephis stared at him with a grim expression, her own breathing laborious and pained. If this was a cliché drama, at that point, they would have exchanged words, expressing their resolve and determination. Admiring their enemy or humiliating them with disparaging insults, showcasing their fearlessness by making a carefree joke. But it was not. Everything that could have been said had been said already. There was no way back. All that remained was violence. Looking at Nephis, Sunny suppressed a devious smile. Something had changed about the proud daughter of the immortal flame clan. Something that he had been waiting for from the start of their vicious battle. The wounds that had been partially closed by the white flame were beginning to seep blood again. And as they did, the blood blossom charm hanging on a thread tied around his neck finally rose from its slumber, filling the midnight shard with boundless hunger. Enhanced by the blood blossom, the austere Tachi suddenly felt lighter in his hands, full of cold, frightening determination. It was almost as, though it had a mind of its own now, a mind focused on one goal, to find the enemy and get a taste of their blood. Finally, a moment later, Nephis attacked again, her beautiful face cold and indifferent like an alabaster mask. Only the flames in her eyes moved, burning furiously, white as the empty void of the godless heavens above their heads. Sonny gritted his teeth and moved to meet her. Their blades clashed once again. Just like before, he was shaken by the force of the impact. Only now, he had managed to intercept her strike a fraction of a second faster. It was as though the midnight shard was ever so slightly pulling his hand, making it move with a bit more speed, aim a little better, withstand the pressure of the strikes with a subtly less strain. In the next few seconds, that change had become more apparent. Before, he had no chance to launch an offense. Changing Star was reveling in her flowing and unpredictable battle style, her every movement oppressive and unpredictable. This unpredictability alone made him wary of committing to an attack. Of course, Sonny was using the same style. But even though he had mastered it to an admirable degree, his technique was by no means equal to that of Changing Star. What was worse, she knew it far better than him, so his moves could potentially be predicted with terrifying ease. The only reason why Sonny was still on his feet was because of the elements of the Saint's grounded style that he had incorporated into his own. Measured and precise, but also capable of explosive counterattacks, it allowed him to both defend against Neff's ruthless assault and restrain her to a certain degree, using the threat of a sudden reversal to keep her from going all out. More importantly, she was less familiar with that style, which allowed him to diminish the predictability of his movements. And now, with the help of the Blood Blossom, Sunny was able to resist Nephis more efficiently, even if it was just by a tiny amount. But the measure of that difference didn't really matter. Because the longer their fight went on and the more she bled, the stronger he would become. It wasn't long before he finally managed to land a hit, the tip of his sword scratching against one of her gauntlets. This is just a begin. However, his thought was instantly interrupted. What? Nephis suddenly changed her behavior. Perhaps she had sensed the shift in the dynamic between the two of them, or perhaps she was just desperate to end this fight before her powers ran dry and her terrible wounds finally caught up with her. Or maybe there was some other reason, one that Sunny failed to account for. But regardless of it, Neff suddenly abandoned her previous calculated attack pattern and instead descended on him in a rain of deadly steel, her defense crumbling and leaving her open to retaliation. Caught by surprise, Sonny barely had time to shift his stance and block. The Midnight Shard was thrown down by a violent blow, pressing against his shoulder. The Silver Longsword slid across its length and scratched against the guard of the Tachi, mere centimeters away from Sonny's throat. For a few heartbeats, the two of them struggled desperately, trying to overpower the enemy. 
Their bodies were so close that Sunny could feel Neff's breath on his cheek, as well as the heat radiating from her skin. Damn it, she was just stronger. So much stronger. Little by little, her sword angled forward, and then bit into his skin, blood flowing on its silver blade. With an angry growl, Sunny let go of the hilt of the midnight shard with one hand. His fist shot toward Changing Star's body, the ghostly stiletto appearing in it at the last moment. But, of course, Nephis had anticipated that. She twisted her torso, allowing the moonlight shard to leave a deep but harmless scratch on her breastplate. In doing so, she had to relieve pressure on the Tachi, allowing Sunny to push her sword away from his neck. But before he could jump back, Neff finished her attack by delivering a devastating blow to his head with the pommel of her sword. Disoriented, Sunny staggered back. He felt blood streaming into his eyes and lost his vision for a moment. Even shadow sense was useless, because he simply couldn't differentiate up from down right now. Suddenly, his heart was full of dread. Think, think, he had maybe a fraction of a second left before suffering a complete defeat. What is she going to do? The silver longsword was currently, currently, raised slightly above him after the upward strike. The fastest way to finish the fight would be to bring it down, possibly with its flat on his head, or with its edge on his shoulder, thus severing one of his arms. Yes, the second option was the easiest to execute and the most advantageous, but it was Nephis he was thinking about. What would she do? Faced with the choice of protecting his head or his shoulder, Sonny instinctively threw the midnight shard up to block a vertical blow aimed at his skull. His body moved on its own, following the memory of countless hours of training. Thanks to that, he was able to perform the block even in this stunned state. His judgment was correct. The Tachi collided against Changing Star's sword and was thrown aside. But, thanks to that, the strike missed his head completely. Instead, it fell on his clavicle and bit deep into his flesh, scraping against bone. Sonny's world exploded with pain, but instead of letting it overpower him, he leaned forward and caught Neff's hand in a trap, entangling it with his own. Then, he drove the midnight shard forward and felt it pierce soft flesh. Nephis shrieked, her voice full of agony and shock. Then, she pushed him away. Sonny fell to the ground. Damn. Damn, this hurts. Regaining some semblance of control over his mind, he raised a hand and wiped the blood away from his eyes. Then, he rose to his knees and looked in the direction where Nephis had been. She was standings a few meters away, leaning on her sword for support. There was a deep gash in her abdomen, just below the lower edge of the fractured breastplate of the Starlight Legion armor, and a grimace of pain on her face. Blood was flowing from the wound he had caused her like a crimson stream. Their eyes met for a moment, and then Sunny lowered his gaze, at the austere Tachi that lay on the floor between them. In all the mayhem, he had lost his sword. Both of them froze for a second. Then, ignoring the terrible pain pulsating in his wounded shoulder, Sunny lunged forward and grabbed the hilt of the midnight shard. At the same time, Changing Star rushed forward, raising her sword. However, neither of them got a chance to deliver a strike. Because right at that moment, the Crimson Spire shuddered once again, this time much more terribly than before. And in a deafening thunder of breaking stone, the floor beneath their feet suddenly shattered and collapsed into the darkness, pulling them down with it. Sunny fell down in a rain of broken stone, the floor beneath his feet suddenly crumbling like shattered glass. The Crimson Spire shuddered and moaned, like a giant creature convulsing in the throes of death. The light of the artificial sun grew dim and weak, causing another tremor to run through the ancient tower, wide cracks appearing on its granite walls. Sunny had banished the darkness that devoured the forgotten shore every night, and Nephis had killed the vessel of the sun that rose above it every day. Together, they had brought destruction to this cursed land. Today was the end of days for the forgotten shore, one that the two of them had ushered in. And one of them was going to have to endure the fallout of this cataclysmic change. Surrounded by a rain of falling shards of stone, Changing Star twisted and somehow managed to aim her sword in Sunny's direction. Even more miraculously, he managed to intercept it with his own. Both were thrown away from each other, the transparent wings weaving themselves behind their backs. For a couple of seconds, Sunny felt his body plunging down into the darkness. Then, finally, the dark wing fully manifested and turned into a blur, supporting his weight. Dodging a massive slab of granite that threatened to crush him, Sonny used it as a step and propelled himself through the air. The midnight shard flashed, aiming at Changing Star's wings, but was blocked by the blade of the silver longsword. As the debris fell down, two human figures collided against each other and spun in the air. With nothing to serve as a support, the only chance they had to exert any force was to use the body of the enemy as one. Their bodies entangled, almost as if they were lovers. But in reality, of course, the purpose of this intimate closeness was not love, it was violence. Grabbing Nephis with one hand and using his legs to trap hers, Sonny twisted his torso and delivered a devastating blow with his forehead, feeling the brittle bones of her nose shatter under his strike. 
but at the same time, her armored fist crashed into his side, aimed cruelly at the half-closed wound left behind by Castor. Sunny screamed. In the next second, her other fist slammed into his face. Augmented by the weight of the silver sword, that blow caused Sunny to lose himself for a short moment. When he came to his senses, the first thing he saw was a massive slab of granite falling on them from above. Feeling blood stream down his face and from the newly opened wound on his side, Sonny bent his knee, and then used Neff's body to push himself away. The two of them flew into opposite directions, narrowly avoiding being crushed by the enormous piece of stone. Gliding with the help of their enchanted cloaks, Sonny and Nephis circled around each other, moving down in a wide spiral. Both were too preoccupied with dodging the falling pieces of stone to launch another attack, even if they wished to. Around them, the crimson spire was quaking and convulsing, more and more cracks appearing on its walls, whole layers of stone separating from them and plunging down. It felt as though the ancient structure would not be able to hold on for much longer. Above them, the dying sun was growing weaker with each minute, and down below, the runes surrounding the perfect circle of the gateway were shimmering in the darkness, their light slowly becoming unstable. Concentrating at the distant balcony, Sunny hesitated for a moment, then threw a glance at Nephis. Then, he dismissed the dark wing and plunged down, abandoning the safety of flight. Instead, he chose to fall. With air whistling in his ears, Sunny plummeted through the darkness, approaching the vast balcony with terrible speed. Deadly speed. He had to calculate everything perfectly. When the gateway was close enough to discern separate runes shining in a circle around it, he summoned the enchanted cloak again. As the memory began to weave itself into existence, Sunny continued to fall, the stone balcony growing closer and closer. A second later, it was already close enough to see the shapes of the dead coral golems in the darkness. A second more, and a bestial fear took hold of his heart. He was about to die, to splatter on the ground like a crushed bug. Almost at the last moment, the dark wing finally came into existence. Immediately, Sunny activated the enchantment and tried to turn his vertical fall into a horizontal glide. As inertia pulled him down with dreadful speed, he cut a smooth arc in the air and hit the stone surface of the balcony, turning the violent impact into a roll. Then, without losing even a moment, he jumped to his feet and ran toward the gateway. Consumed by pain, Sunny limped over the shimmering runes and entered the ring. Almost immediately, a strange feeling overtook him. It was like... Like that strange and indescribable feeling you get a few seconds before realizing that the reality surrounding you is just a dream, and that you are about to wake up. The light of the runes grew stronger. Simultaneously, Sunny's own body began to glow, emanating the same ethereal light. Before that glow had a chance to become bright, though, a shadow fell from above in a deadly rustle of sharp steel. No. Sunny threw his hands up, deflecting the blow of Changing Star's silver sword. Nephis descended upon him like an avenging angel, the fierce white flames burning in her eyes with frightening intensity. As soon as her feet touched the stone inside the iron ring, the shimmering runes blinked and disappeared. Both conduits were cut off from the crimson spire, thus breaking the flow of soul energy. Without it, the gateway could not function. Only if one of them was thrown outside would the runes ignite once again. Sunny gritted his teeth and thrust his sword forward, hoping to get Nephis before she had time to regain her balance. But she was too fast, too cunning. Before he could even get close to piercing her flesh, Changing Star was already moving, trapping his blade under her own and throwing it aside. Sunny rammed into her, throwing all of his weight into one devastating blow. At the same time, he felt cold steel brushing against his ribs, causing more blood to stream down. The two of them collided with frightening force and fell out of the iron ring of the gateway, rolling down the steps of the dais. As soon as the first of them crossed the circle of runes, they shimmered and shined once again. Sunny fell on the cold stones and remained lying there, consumed by pain and exhaustion. A low, tortured moan escaped from his lips. Something was broken inside of him. He felt weak, and cold. He didn't want to stand up. I am not done yet. I'm not. Sunny lay on the ground, gulping air like a dying fish. It felt as though he was drowning. His body was a map of pain. He couldn't even remember how many injuries he had received. There was the gash in his side left by Castor's gen, the gruesome wound that almost severed his clavicle, the long cut across his ribs, and many smaller ones. But he was still alive. He was still able to fight. He was still not willing to give up. All around him, the crimson spire was trembling and groaning, slowly starting to collapse. Gritting his teeth, Sonny tiredly pushed himself off the ground. His body protested, but he forced it into silence and slowly rose to his feet. The blade of the midnight shard scraped against the stones as he pulled it up. Nephis was doing the same. The young woman stood up and staggered, then regained her balance and grew still. Her posture was slumped, with one hand pressed tightly against the deep wound on her abdomen. Changing Star looked weak and beaten, her fearsome presence diminished. Her face was pale, 
bloodied, and grim, contorted by a grimace of suffering. Only her eyes, which burned with dimming white flames, were still the same, striking, cold, and full of unshakable resolve. Both of them were washed in the ethereal light of the gateway. Looking at Neff through that light, Sunny slowly inhaled and said in a hoarse voice, Let's finish this. She stared at him for a few moments, then grinned. Her teeth were painted red by blood. In the next moment, Nephis raised her sword and dashed forward, sending a cloud of dust into the air with her feet. They clashed beneath the dais of the gateway, their swords whistling through the air like hungry fiends. The clangor of steel drowned the sound of breaking stone, resounding in the darkness of the crimspawn spire once again. Both Sunny and Nephis were gruesomely wounded, but neither allowed their agony and pain to make them weaker. Instead, they fought with ruthless ferociousness, throwing everything they had left at the enemy, not holding anything back. Now that changing star was bleeding heavily, the blood blossom hanging on Sonny's neck entered a state of frenzy. At times, it felt as though his sword moved on its own, helping him strike faster, harder, with deadlier precision. He had never been as powerful as he was now. And yet, it was not enough. Nephis was still too much for him to handle. She was still too strong, too fast, too overwhelming. She was more like a monster than a human. A demon of silver steel wreathed in pale white flames. Sonny managed to add several deep cuts to her harrowing collection of injuries, but the damage he received in return was twice as terrible. His left arm was slowly growing numb, weakening his grip on the hilt of the midnight shard. His lungs were burning, and it was getting harder and harder to inhale. With each breath, a wet, disturbing sound fell from his lips. His eyes were burning, too, his vision becoming blurry because of all the blood streaming into them. He had to rely on shadow sense a lot to make up for this debilitating affliction. I can't. I can't go on like this. He had to think of something. Something devious and smart. Something that would work. But, for the first time, Sonny's bag of tricks was empty. No matter how much he thought, he couldn't imagine anything that would defeat Nephis. She knew him too well. Better than anyone in the entire world. Two worlds, even. And yet, Sonny felt that he had no chance of victory if everything continued as it had. He was already just one step away from death. And so, he did the one thing he could think of. A desperate gamble with little chance of success. Summoning all of his remaining strength and resilience, he forced his perception to shift. And started weaving the strange, taxing movements of the incomplete shadow dance into his technique. He allowed his mind to become formless and shapeless, and then aimed at a changing star, trying to mimic her incredible battle art to the smallest detail. And use it as a weapon to destroy her. After all, if not Neff, then who could he ever imitate? He was the person who knew her best in the world, too. He was her companion, friend, and pupil. He was already practically her shadow, her compliant little helper, caught in the net of her schemes, in her insane, insatiable desire, and incapable of breaking free, not only because there was no other choice, but also because he didn't really, didn't really want to be apart from her. He knew her flowing, deadly battle style better than anyone except for Nephis herself. After all, he had practiced it as well, spending countless hours to master its foundation and gain insight into its principles. From repeating the same downward slash hundred of thousands of times to this terrible battle, he had never stopped learning from her. If he had a chance to make that one final step to mastering the first level of Shadow Dance, it was in a fight against her. And so Sunny fought, summoning the memory of the beautiful slave girl dancing with her seven shadows. He strained his already failing body to its limit, past the limit, trying to force it to perfectly reflect changing star's deadly grace and fearsome elegance. Put under that strain, his body began to collapse. Sonny felt as though there was something brittle in the center of his chest, a small part of his body that was slowly cracking under the pressure. With each move he made, a new crack appeared on its surface. He just hoped that he would make the breakthrough before that small part exploded. If he could endure just a little more, do a little more, understand a little more. But in the end, he didn't. After another strange and excruciating move, one that somehow felt different from all the rest, the delicate thing in his chest suddenly shuddered, and broke. For a moment, Sonny felt as a marionette whose strings had been cut. His eyes widened in horror. And then, the midnight shard shivered slightly. In the next second, the invisible well of power hidden in his souls opened, and a flood of rejuvenating strength carried his exhaustion away. When something in Sonny's chest shattered, the hidden enchantment of the midnight shard, unbroken, came into effect and opened the floodgates of power to support him in the desperate, defiant last stand. Of course, the blood weave was enhanced by it, too, boosting its restorative powers. The virtuous cycle was complete, simultaneously making him much stronger and bringing him away from death's doorstep. Changing star's sword whistled through the air, aiming to pierce his flesh, and was thrown aside by the forceful push of the austere Tachi. For the first time since the beginning of their brutal fight, Sonny didn't reel because of the violent shock reverberating through his bones. 
Now, he had reached the absolute pinnacle of his power potential. With his core fully saturated, the shadow wrapped around his body, the blood blossom filling his memories with frenzied might, and the unbroken enchantment of the stalwart blade doing the same for his body. Sonny was as strong as he would ever be before becoming an awakened. Now, he was finally able to match Nephis. Almost. Astoundingly, incredibly, irrationally, she was still stronger. How? How? Damn it. Sonny moved and fought, blood seeping from his terrible wounds. Although the gap in power between him and Changing Star had diminished significantly, it was still there, making him miss his attacks by a fraction of a second, be too late to block and deflect by a hair's breadth. He was still losing. As the two of them clashed furiously, sparks of burning metal flying into the air from the point where their swords met, the light of the artificial sun had grown dim and unstable, and the crimson spire continued to break apart. At some point, an enormous piece of granite crashed into the vast balcony, showering them with a rain of sharp splinters. A net of cracks appeared on the stone surface beneath their feet, slowly widening as more debris fell down. Both of them were thrown to the ground by the shockwave of the collision, but immediately got up, lunging at each other with dark, murderous determination. Sonny dodged the tip of the silver longsword and thrust his tachi forward, leaving a deep cut on Neff's forearm, slicing her muscles apart. At the same time, she made a step forward and slammed the pommel of her sword into his mauled clavicle, making Sonny's mind explode with pain. He heard someone scream, their voice hoarse and full of indescribable suffering, then realized a moment later that that bestial voice was his own. Soon, the scream turned into a growl. He wasn't done yet. He refused to be defeated, he refused to give up. He still had a chance to win. Because through all of this, Sonny had continued to push himself toward mastering the first step of the shadow dance. Just before something shattered in his chest, thus causing the midnight shard to open the well of hidden power, he had sensed an approaching epiphany. It was already there, at the precipice of his mind, but his body was not strong enough, not malleable enough to manifest it into reality, or at least it had not been before receiving the boon of the, unbroken. Now, everything changed, Sonny felt that he would be able to make a breakthrough with the help of the powerful enchantment. Every strike, every block, every step brought him closer to finally being able to complete the foundation of his elusive battle art, to bring his vision of it to fruition. Taking a pained breath, he deflected another vicious attack, hesitated for a split second and looked away from Nephis. Instead of watching her body and her movements, he instead gazed at her shadow. The shadow shifted slightly, facing away from the glowing ring of the gateway. Its shadow hands moved, raising a shadow sword. The shadow sword fell, aiming to cut the shadow's enemy down. And suddenly, it felt as though a door opened in his mind. Everything suddenly fell into place. Everything connected. What was fragmented and obscured before now became clear and whole. It was. Complete. Before Neff's sword could reach him, Sonny evaded it with a slight shift and raised the midnight shard. A moment later, he delivered an identical strike, forcing her to retreat. Like that? Changing Star was already attacking again, moving with speed and precision that seemed inhuman. Sonny mirrored her movements, and their blades collided in the air, causing a rain of sparks to fly down. His style changed slightly, growing more graceful. Smooth, flowing, deadly. Just like hers. No, this is wrong. The point of shadow dance was not to mirror every movement, to become a literal copy. It was to understand the very essence of the enemy's style and turn it against them. Sonny scowled and changed his grip on the midnight shard slightly, then attacked, manifesting the essence of changing star's technique into his own body. Suddenly, he was able to see her intentions with more clarity, understand the pattern of her steps better. He was able to perform every action she had performed, but also those that she had not used yet. After all, he was not a reflection, but a shadow. He wasn't replicating Changing Star's movements. Instead, he was replicating Changing Star herself, the very heart of her battle technique. Neff's eyes widened when she felt the sudden change in his style. When they clashed again, Sunny seemed to be able to mirror her every move throwing the flow of combat into a violent turmoil. His movements were sharper, faster, filled with more meaningful intent. Her attack slowed down for a few moments, then grew even more violent and ferocious. Only now, they seemed to be less measured, less controlled. It was as though she had lost her absolute grasp on the cadence of the battle, and was now compensating for it with brute strength. Sonny suspected that the small advantage he had gained wasn't going to last long. Nephis was too smart and too gifted to allow this lack of understanding to persist. Soon, she was going to see through the guiding principle of his newly established style and adjust to resist it, even he couldn't predict what was going to happen then. That is why, despite his best judgment, Sonny gritted his teeth and escalated his attacks, sacrificing any semblance of defense in the process. This had to end fast. At first, 
He was able to see Neff's intentions with a considerable measure of clarity, allowing him to react to her attack slightly before she started to move. When possible, he neared her strikes to throw the flow of the battle into chaos. His own came with a tiny delay, lagging behind the enemy by a fraction of a second. Then, they happened at the same time. And then, miraculously, his attacks started to come in advance of changing stars, even if the difference was barely perceptible. That was all Sunny needed. In the terrible crescendo of their merciless duel, blood fell to the cracking stone of the gateway balcony like crimson rain. He dashed forward, turning his torso sideways to let the silver longsword miss his chest and rip through his bicep instead. As a blinding wave of pain flooded his mind, Sonny caught Neff's arm with his own. And then, twisting it, brought his fist on her elbow, shattering it. As pieces of bloodied bone tore through her skin, Nephis shrieked terribly and made an awkward move, trying to smash him in the head with the flat of her sword. But because it was now only held in one hand, the force and speed of that strike were not as formidable as that of her previous attacks. Diving under the blade of the silver longsword, Sunny fell to one knee, and pushed the midnight shard forward in a horizontal cut, its blade tearing through Neff's abdomen and exiting in a flood of blood from her back. Pulled by the inertia of her attack, Nephis made a step forward and came to a sudden stop. As the sword slid from her grip and clattered to the cold stones, she swayed a little, and then fell heavily to the ground. The radiance of her skin was slowly fading away. With his back to her, Sonny stared into the darkness. After a few moments, he closed his eyes and sighed. Over. A second or two later, he stood up, turned around, and walked toward the broken figure of the young woman, who was still trying to reach for her sword, blood spilling from her mouth. As Sonny's shadow fell on Nephis, she gritted her teeth and spat. It's. It's not over yet. I still can. I can. Ruthlessly throwing the silver long word away with the tip of his boot, Sonny looked at her from above and said in a tired, listless voice. You can't. It's over, Neff. Then, he looked away, at the shining dais of the gateway. His face was hidden in the shadows. You're done. He won. Looking at the shining gateway, Sonny tasted that word. Why was it so bitter? Why was it so painful? Why wasn't it sweet and joyous? With a dark grimace, he glanced at Nephis, and then turned away. What could he say to her that had any meaning? One of them was going to escape this hell, and the other was going to stay. One was victorious, and the other was defeated. One of them was going to live, and the other was going to die. Any words he could find would be empty, but not empty enough to express the hollow sense in his heart. His feet trembled as he made the first step toward the gateway. To hell with this. Why did his heart have to feel so heavy? Why wasn't he celebrating? He deserved to be saved. He struggled and suffered to get to come this far, enduring countless horrors that would have broken and destroyed anyone else. He bled and fought, clawing his way to this point, never allowing himself to rest or stop growing. He, he, was the strongest. He was the last one left standing. Not the countless nightmare creatures of the forgotten shore. Not Harris, that damned hunchback. Not Gunlock, the mighty bright lord. Not Castor, the strongest even among other legacies. Not even Changing Star, the last daughter of the legendary immortal Flask clan. No, it was him. A homeless kid from the outskirt with no place to call his own, someone whom no one had ever expected to survive, let alone thrive in the ruthless embrace of the nightmare spell. Whom everyone considered to be below them, an inconsequential nobody with no chance of ever becoming anything else. Well, he showed them all, had he not? Gritting his teeth in anger, Sonny made another step. To hell with you. Behind him, Nephis had finally abandoned her hopeless attempts to reach her sword. As Sunny walked away, she slowly crawled a few steps, then arduously pushed herself and sat up, leaning on a piece of rubble. The light of the gateway reflected in her eyes as she watched him go, hunched, seemingly unable to move anymore. Stepping over a wide crack in the stone that was slowly approaching the shimmering circle of runes, Sunny came to the iron ring. Now, only one step separated him from freedom. But instead of making it, he suddenly froze, looking into the distance with a grim expression on his face. A second passed by, then another. The crimson spire shuddered once again, sending more stone falling down. As the light of the artificial sun grew so dim that it was almost impossible to see, Sunny swayed a little, then turned around and walked back to Nephis. Stopping above her, he lingered for a moment, then kneeled, so that their faces were on the same level. Looking Neph right in the eyes, Sunny raised his hands and clapped several times. Finally, he said in a terrible, furious voice, Congratulations. You almost fooled me. Nephis stared at him tiredly, straining to understand his words. The radiance was gone from beneath her skin, and instead of it, white flames had once again appeared, licking weakly at her wounds. However, their power was almost gone. Instead of healing, all they could do now was stem the bleeding and prevent Changing Star from dying right there and then. A few seconds later, 
She opened her mouth, letting blood flow over her lips, and said in a low, barely audible voice, What? Are you talking about? Sonny snarled. Drop the act. Your performance was, indeed, masterful. But don't forget who taught you how to lie in the first place. Did you really think that you would be able to deceive me? She was silent for a few moments, then whispered, I don't. Understand. He looked at her and asked, his voice shaking with anger, Why did you do it? Why? Nephis blinked and drew in a shaky breath, but didn't say anything, looking at him with pain and confusion. Realizing that she wasn't going to answer, Sonny spat. Why did you throw the fight? She lingered for a moment, then said quietly, I didn't. A bitter smile appeared on Sonny's lips. Shaking his head, he said, You almost made it work, you know, I almost bought it. But after all of it was done and I could think clearly, some things really didn't add up. They didn't make any sense. No matter how I looked at it, something felt wrong. The spire swayed, drowning their voices in the sound of breaking stone. Not paying it any attention, Sonny continued. First, I know for a fact that you are somehow able to support two augmentations at the same time. You did so while fighting Gunlock. One to enhance your sword, the other to enhance your body. I rarely forget things, so how could I not remember this? Once you were heavily injured, you summoned back the flames from the sword and were able to simultaneously strengthen yourself and heal those wounds. And yet, you only used one when fighting me. Funny, isn't it? Nephis stared at him, not saying anything. Then, she uttered. My powers were exhausted. Sunny spat. I would have believed that, maybe, if not for your other mistakes. Back at the top of the spire, you had an opportunity to cut off my arm, ending the fight right there and then. That was the best course of action, the swiftest and most effective attack you could have performed. But instead, you chose a less advantageous method and went for my head, striking with the flat of the blade. A grim expression appeared on his face. Someone else might have made that choice, but not you. Not changing star, the sword saint. The only reason for you to pass on that golden opportunity is that you never really wanted to win, didn't you? He looked up and grimaced, pain assaulting his mind like a furious sea. And finally, why did you even stay there at the top of the tower, waiting for me to come? If you wanted to escape, you could have gone to the gateway as soon as you realized what the sole conduit was, not even giving me a chance to save myself. But you did not. You just sat there quietly and waited, ignoring your chance to reach the gateway first. So, why? He looked at her and shouted, the pain finally finding its way into his voice. Why the hell did you pretend to go all out on me while planning to lose from the start? Nephis stared at him for a while, her face pale and inexorable. Then, she sighed and looked away. After a moment, she said quietly, maybe it is because I am far away from home, too. Sonny stared at her for a couple of moments, then snarled, what? What the hell is that supposed to mean? Changing star turned her head and looked at him calmly, then smiled. All right, Sonny. You caught me, now go. This tower won't last much longer. As she said that, the white flames flowing from her wounds suddenly flashed, growing stronger and brighter. Her injuries started to heal once again, not as fast as in the past, but still with considerable speed. Her eyes shined with fearsome radiance. He gritted his teeth. Like hell I will, not before you give me an answer. Nephis shrugged tiredly, then looked him in the eyes. What it is that you want to know? Sonny clenched his fists. Why even fight me if you wanted to let me win all along? She sighed, as he stared at her with burning intensity, Neff said, isn't it obvious? Because if I didn't, you wouldn't go. Turning away, she lingered for a moment, and then continued, people. People are usually either cruel or kind, but not you. You can be both, depending on the situation, either ruthless or compassionate, either cruel or kind. So that's what I did. I created a situation that would allow you to be ruthless and cruel, to leave me behind without showing any mercy. Sonny stared at her, his fists trembling. But why? Why would you doom yourself to save me? What happened to your goddamned goal? Didn't you tell me that you will sacrifice anything, anyone, to achieve it? Nephis looked at him and smiled bitterly. Why? Are you the only one who is allowed to grow and change? Can't I change too, Sonny? She turned away and said tiredly, her voice full of invisible, but crushing weight. Yes. I did say such a thing. But saying and doing are two different things, Sonny. Once it all started. Once all those people were dying because of what I have done. Once I suffered defeat after defeat. It was more difficult than I could ever imagine. It was. Distasteful. He shook his head in shock. So. That's it? You just gave up? After all that crap, you just decided that it was too much for you? Changing star remained quiet for a bit, then slowly shook her head. You don't really understand me at all, do you, Sonny? Facing him, she grinned. Give up? No, I didn't give up. I didn't abandon my goal. I just realized that I was not ambitious enough. 
As white flames grew brighter in her eyes, Nephis said, I am going to destroy the spell, and all those who stand in my way. I will accomplish everything that I want, but I will also do it in the way that I want. I will do it in a way that suits my desire, without compromising anything, without sacrificing my sense of right and wrong. Illuminated by white radiance, her pale, bloodied face seemed like a face of a demon. Manipulating all those people, causing their deaths, I would do it again. I would kill more if I needed to, because it was fair and right. I gave them the chance to save themselves, or die fighting against the spell. There is no better way. For a moment, her eyes were aflame with passion. However, then, her expression suddenly changed. Looking down, Nephis added in a quiet voice. But abandoning you here would be vile, and wrong. It would leave a bad taste in my mouth. Just like leaving a helpless blind girl to die alone would. I won't do it. If I do, I would be no better than those who I want to destroy. What's the point of reaching my goal if, in the process, I become the same as those whom I hate? She pierced him with a burning gaze and said, No, Sonny, my goal hasn't changed. It's just that reaching by using a wrong path is worse than not reaching it at all. But why do you care, anyway? Don't you think that it is insane? Don't you think that I am despicable and vile? So, go. Why are you hesitating? Sonny stared at her, a deep frown appearing on his face. Finally, he asked. I'm hesitating because of you, fool. What about you? Nephis smiled. What about me? Do you think I will die here, in this tower? No. I will. I will be fine. I will escape it and survive, somehow. I'll find another way out. No matter how long it's going to take me, I will. Nothing will stop me. You know it won't. He stared at her for a while, then glanced at the shimmering gateway. The crack traveling through the stone balcony was already almost upon the circle of runes, threatening to destroy them. Salvation was so close, he could almost taste it. Turning away from the dais, Sonny shook his head. That is a horrible plan. You want to travel around the dream realm battling nightmare creatures? Fine. Let's do it together. We can try to go through the hollow mountains and reach the human citadels on the other side. And that's just the south. We can also try north, east, and west, searching for an unclaimed gateway. Two of us will have a better chance to survive. The two of us, together. It's better than being alone, right? She hesitated for a long time, then closed her eyes and slowly shook her head. When she spoke, her voice was wistful and tired. No. I can't. I can't let you stay, Sonny. Go. Go and meet your sister. There's something waiting for you in the real world, at least. All that's waiting for me is emptiness, bloodshed, and graves. If I return, the same thing that happened in the bright castle will repeat itself, over and over again, until there's nothing else. So go while you can. The runes of the gateway shimmered, as if on the verge of disappearing. He gritted his teeth. No. Nephis opened her eyes and looked at him, a sense of sorrow appearing on her face. Leave me, Sonny. Please. Go. He shook his head stubbornly. I don't want to. Changing Star was silent for a moment, looking at him with a pained expression. And then she said, making his world crumble. Go. Lost from light. His eyes widened. Deep within his soul, something moved and rose from slumber, triumphant. Unbreakable, eternal, irresistible. Complete, perfect, and sweet. Before Sonny knew what he was doing, his hand shot forward, the ghostly blade of the moonlight shard appearing in it. Stop. His hand froze, the tip of the stiletto mere centimeters away from Neff's eye. Trembling, he looked at his arm and willed it to move forward. But it didn't. It didn't move at all. It was as though that hand did not belong to him anymore. As deep horror drowned his heart, Sonny moved his gaze and looked at Nephis, his eyes wide with shock. H. How? A sad smile appeared on her lips. How did I know? Cassie told me. Neff sighed and looked away. She was the first one to understand the meaning of her vision. She knew that the two of us will end up fighting each other, and that I was going to lose, maybe even die. She just didn't know how, when, and why. So, Cassie told me your secret, in hopes that it will save my life one day. But I, I hoped that I would never have to use it. Sonny stared at her, too shocked to say anything. She smiled sadly. So, then, I guess. I guess this is goodbye. Ta. I hope that you'll take care of yourself, Sonny. Now, go. Escape before it is too late. Even though Sonny didn't do anything, his body moved on its own. Standing up, he turned around and walked toward the shining ring of the gateway. Step, step, another step. Stop. Stop. But his body would not listen. It just continued to move forward, indifferent to his commands. A dull ache settled somewhere in the center of his heart. Stop. There was nothing he could do. He was a miraculous shadow bound to a master. Once the master gave a command, he had no choice but to obey. Sonny slowly walked up the steps of the dais and approached the circle of runes, then crossed the iron ring without slowing down. As soon as he did, 
The rune shone with intense light. His body began to glow, too. No. I refuse. The ethereal radiance grew brighter and brighter, until it became hard to discern the human figure in its middle. No. And then, suddenly, it disappeared, leaving only emptiness behind. Sunny was gone, finally free of this long and arduous nightmare. The journey back to reality that had taken him more than a year was now over. He made it out alive. Just a few seconds after he disappeared in a flash of light, the crack in the stone reached the circle of runes and broke it. The shine of the gateway grew unstable and swiftly faded away. At the same time, the artificial sun of the forgotten shore ignited one last time with a bright, intense explosion of light, and then extinguished. Left alone in the collapsing tower and with no more light to shine upon her, the beaten, broken figure of Changing Star disappeared into the shadows. Once again, Sonny found himself in the endless space between dream of reality. All around him, there was nothing but a boundless black void, which was illuminated by a myriad of bright stars. Between those stars, countless strings of silver light were woven into a beautiful and inconceivably complex pattern. Once again, he felt as though he had glimpsed the inner workings of the spell. Was it just an illusion, or was he able to see more now? It was almost as if his eyes were now able to discern a hint of meaning behind the unimaginable, titanic brilliance of the ethereal weave. He had the eyes of Weaver now, after all. With a pained moan, Sonny forced himself to look away from the strings of silver light. The magnitude of the secret hidden in this cosmic pattern was so immense that just thinking about it could drive him mad. The forgotten shore had taught him an important lesson, and it was that one had to be careful about what they looked upon. Some things were not meant to be seen by humans. Not to mention that he had other things to think about. Curse it. Curse it all. Curse all of you. His voice disappeared into the darkness, full of indescribable fury, bitterness, and sorrow. No one was there to hear it. Except for the spell, which chose to tactfully remain silent. Breathing heavily, Sonny clenched his fists and closed his eyes. He didn't know what brought him more rage and pain, the fact that he had lost Neff, or the fact that his secret had been revealed. Both were too bitter to swallow. All that time, all that suffering. And for what? He had outsmarted and defeated so many powerful enemies, only for his true name to be discovered by an ungrateful, weak, blind girl? After everything he had done for her, Cassie's betrayal, perhaps, had hurt him the most. Curse her. Once again, he was a slave. He made a full circle and returned exactly to where he had started. In shackles. Only instead of nameless slavers, Nephis had become his master now. Nephis. Sonny gritted his teeth and groaned, a storm of conflicting emotions tearing his heart apart. Why did she have to do it? Why? The pain of losing her, the hope of finding her again. Was just as strong and overwhelming as the hope that she would die and disappear forever in the unforgiving hell of the dream realm, so that they would never have to meet again. So that he would be free. He clawed at his face, not knowing how to process this conflagration of feelings. For someone who had spent most of his life alone, not caring for anything, this was all just too much. Luckily, time in this boundless void was a strange concept, so he had an eternity to try and come to terms with his new reality. The spell kept silent, as though giving him a chance to do just that. After a while, maybe hours, or maybe days, or maybe just a single second, Sonny sighed. Some time later, he opened his mouth and whispered, I won. He had survived. Who could have thought? Slightly more than a year ago, he was thrown into a region of the dream realm that no human had ever escaped, and now, he was not only returning to reality, but a slow doing so as one of the most powerful sleepers in the history of the human race. Maybe even the strongest one, or the second strongest. He had survived countless horrors, crossed a cursed sea on a boat made of demon bones, slew hundreds of nightmare creatures, gained experience and scars worthy of a lifetime, touched the hidden knowledge of the gods, saw a tyrant die and a new one be crowned, banished an ancient curse into the darkness of oblivion and watched as a son died. And now, he was about to become an awakened, an elite among elites, a person at the very top of society, one with access to the best food, the most wealth, the highest forms of prestige. The highest. Everything. All his dreams were going to come true. All his suffering would now be rewarded. I will not be sad. I will not be bitter. I will not be angry. Who should I? Had he gone through this nightmare to be left heartbroken on the other side? No. He had earned this joy, this delight, this triumph. And he was going to enjoy it. Slowly, a shaky smile appeared on Sonny's face. At first, he had to force himself, but after a while, the smile became sincere. That's right, victory is supposed to be sweet. So, let's see. What should I start with? As if answering him, the spell finally spoke. Its voice sounded a little strange, as if it was continuing a sentence after being interrupted. Your shadow is overflowing with power. Your shadow is taking shape. Suddenly, Sonny felt his soul begin to radiate a strange heat once again. Crap. Your shadow is complete. 
something inside of him exploded, drowning his whole being with indescribably suffering. With a startled yelp, Sonny fell down. How come? How come I end up on my ass every time I come to this place? The first time Sonny had appeared in the void, he was so shocked to discover the divine rank of his aspect that his legs buckled. And now, due to the painful transformation happening to his soul, he ended up in the same situation again. Because he had left the crimson spire, the soul conduit attribute was gone. And without its interference, the strange process that had begun due to the saturation of the shadow core was finally able to continue. It was just as painful as Sonny remembered. Gritting his teeth to prevent himself from screaming, Sonny tried to endure the terrible agony. He was no stranger to physical pain, but this was something different. It came from the soul itself, and for that reason, was so much worse. Arg, damn it all. However, it was still not nearly as bad as the chilling torture he had gone through after consuming the drop of Weaver's blood, or the nightmare he had endured after meeting the Black Knight for the first time. And it didn't last as long. After a while, the pain lessened, and then finally disappeared, leaving him feeling refreshed and whole again. Sonny carefully stood up and looked down, checking to see if he was still in one piece. He felt stronger, much, much stronger, stronger, faster, more resilient, very much so. He felt so powerful, in fact, that for a moment Sonny even entertained the idea that he had subconsciously commanded his shadow to wrap itself around his body, and was now enjoying the effect of its augmentation. To make sure that this wasn't the case, he habitually glanced down to check on the shadow, and froze. What? The hell? The shadow was not wrapped around his body. It was where it was supposed to be, on the unseen surface Sonny was standing on, somehow visible despite the darkness of the black void. But it wasn't alone. Two identical shadows were currently staring back at Sonny. One seemed sulking and morose, and the other appeared to be joyful and friendly. Sonny stared at the two shadows, dumbfounded. After a while, he said in an uncertain tone, Am I? Am I seeing things, or are there two of you? The shadows, of course, did not answer. They had no vocal cords, after all. However, the sulking one looked at him with contempt and shook its head in derision. The friendly one, meanwhile, looked down shyly and slightly shrugged. What is going on? Frowning, Sonny lingered for some time and then dove into the soul sea. With the, soul conduit, attribute gone, it was back to its usual, tenebrous appearance. The surface of the water was tranquil and still, and hundreds of motionless shadows stood silently in the darkness. Above him, shining spheres containing the memories were circling around the. Sunny raised his head, then flinched. Where the black sun of the shadow core had once loomed above the quiet sea, there was now. Two, two identical shadow cores hovered in the dark sky, shining with lightless black radiance. He blinked. 2. There's two of them. A few minutes passed, or at least something that felt like a few minutes. There's two. I have two cores. Why do I have two cores? Humans only ever had one soul core. That was a fact. Only nightmare creatures had more. Sonny looked down at his hands, then made them into fists, feeling newly gained strength course through his muscles. Then, he scowled and looked up again. Your shadow is taking shape, your shadow is complete. So the spell was not speaking about the bad-tempered shadow that had accompanied him for so long. Initially, Sonny had assumed that the shadow, and his core, were going through a transformation due to the acquisition of the thousandth fragment, perhaps evolving or even awakening. But the spell actually meant to say that his second shadow, and thus a second shadow core, were complete. They had been assembled from the thousand shadow fragments he had collected. Making him a... What? Sonny hesitated for a bit, then ordered the shadows to wrap themselves around his body. The sulking one seemingly rolled its eyes before obeying the command. The friendly one seemed extremely delighted to do as he asked. Both flowed up and covered his body. Immediately, Sonny felt his already considerable strength double, and then triple. His mouth hung open. Too powerful. This is too powerful. This was incredible. To experiment further, he commanded one of the shadows to return to the surface of the tranquil water. A moment later, he had a shadow once again, but still enjoyed the familiar augmentation even if it grew weaker, returning to its previous strength. He then summoned the Midnight Shard and ordered the second shadow to wrap itself around its blade. Now, both his body and his sword were augmented. Then, he sent the sulking shadow to join the friendly one. His body was not enhanced anymore, but the austere Tachi felt much sharper, more lethal, more deadly. Finally, he commanded one shadow to leave the Midnight Shard and cover the puppeteer's shroud. Two memories were augmented at the same time. Holy hell. This was just too good. Sonny stood silently for a while, staring into the distance. So this was it. This was the most unique, most powerful side of his aspect. A divine aspect, after all, was not necessarily more powerful than a lesser one. But it had much more potential. 
With the second core and a second shadow, the gap between Sonny and the other Awaken was going to increase, and if he was right about it. If he was right, this was only the beginning. Because if there was a second core, there would most likely be the third one, and then the fourth. Suddenly, it all made sense. Why Nephis never seemed to be able to saturate her soul core, no matter how many shards she absorbed, no matter how many nightmare creatures and humans she slew. Why she had been incapacitated after killing Gunlock. Why she was so much stronger, faster, and more powerful than him, even at his peak. It was because her aspect was divine, just like his. But she had discovered its secret much sooner than him. As a dull pain appeared in his heart, Sonny banished the image of Changing Star from his mind and summoned the runes. He had to make sure that his guess was right. Name. Sunless. True name. Lost from light. Rank. Dreamer. Below that, new runes were shimmering in the darkness. Sonny's eyes widened. Class. Monster. Shadow cores. Two sevenths. He stared at the glowing runes, his face calm, his heart engulfed by a dark fire. Monster. Two out of seven. He was right, after all. His progression path was indeed different from all of humanity. It was harder, larger, but also so much more promising. The promise of it was as vast as it was frightening. He was reluctant to even try to imagine the pinnacle of what he would potentially be able to achieve. The possibilities were simply limitless. What would a human with seven cores and the might of a titan be capable of? What obstacles would they be unable to conquer? Who would dare to stand in their way? Who would dare to call them their slave? Of course, the road to creating five more cores would be long and arduous. It would take him years, if not decades, if he even manages to live that long. In fact, the magnitude and scale of such an ambition were nothing short of insane. After all, the stronger he grows, the stronger enemies he would have to face to collect their shadow fragments. It seemed all but impossible. Almost. Was he really going to try? After some time, Sonny lowered his gaze and continued to read the runes. His face looked like that of a madman. There were simultaneously a deep frown and a wide smile somehow coexisting on it, making for a strange sight. But then, the wide smile disappeared, leaving only the frown behind. There was something even more important waiting for him in the glow of ethereal runes. Something even more frightening. Reaching the lowest part of the field of runes, he read. Aspect. Shadow Slave. Aspect Rank. Divine. Aspect Description. You are a miraculous shadow left behind by a dead god. As a divine shadow, you possess plenty of strange and wondrous powers. However, your existence is empty and lonesome. You mourn the passing of your former master and long to find a new one. Right beneath it was the description of the part of the aspect that had cursed his life, turning it into a nightmare. Innate ability, shadow bond. Ability description, find a worthy master and let them know your true name. Once they recite it out loud, you will be bound to their will, unable to disobey any command. It is improper for a shadow, let alone a divine one, to walk around without a master. However, the runes describing shadow bond were gray and lifeless, as though the ability was now inactive. Dot 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 makes sense. He had a master now, after all. He wasn't free to walk around without one anymore. And speaking of it, right below, new runes were now shining in the darkness. Master, changing star. Sonny stared at those three words for a long time. Who knew that just three words could bear such a crushing weight, such a vast and complicated meaning. Finally, he shook his head slightly and concentrated, making the runes shine brighter, new ones appearing out of nowhere as he watched. Name, Nephis. True name, Changing Star. E, Rank, Dreamer, Class, Demon. The runes shimmered in the tranquil darkness of the Silent Sea. Name, Nephis. True name, Changing Star. Just as Sunny had suspected, that true name had many meanings. It didn't describe a star that was always changing, but instead a star that caused change. However, there were a lot of words for change in the runic language, each hiding a unique meaning. The one used here meant a cataclysmic change that brought ruin and disaster, sometimes bad and sometimes good, but always cruel and calamitous, wreathed in misfortune. So, in a sense, Nephis was neither a star of change nor a star of ruin, but both, the two went hand in hand, inseparable, destined to bring both salvation and damnation to those touched by her light. Just like what had happened to the doomed dreamers of the Dark City. The spell was really good at giving names, it seemed. Thinking of his own true name somberly, Sonny read further. Rank, Dreamer. Class, Demon. Soul Cores, 3 sevenths. Soul Fragments, 2749 3 thousandths. He stared at the last two strings, a dark expression written on his face. So this. This is how far ahead of me you are. Then, with a heavy sigh, he looked away. Many events of the past few months made sense now. During the fight against Gunlock, Nephis had already been a dormant monster. Just like he was right now, a dreamer in possession of two cores. 
It was because she had known that killing the Bright Lord would push her toward the third that she asked him to prevent Castor from attacking her in that moment of weakness. And in the time since, Changing Star had almost reached the fourth. How was she so fast? Sunny had made a conscious choice to avoid saturating his core during the civil war in the Bright Castle. In hindsight, this decision had turned out to be a wrong one. Or maybe not. If he had collected all thousand shadow fragments back then, he might have been dead already, killed by one of Tessai's guards or a nightmare creature while completely incapacitated by the formation of the second shadow core. Hell, he would have been crushed to death by a piece of falling granite if not for the soul conduit, suppressing the process at the best possible moment. Just as always, terrible misfortune had come together with incredible luck. But even if he had come to possess the monster core back then, he would have never managed to create a third, let alone get this close to the fourth one. It was because Nephis had one big advantage over him in the matter of collecting essence. Like every awakened except for Sunny, she received a certain portion of the enemy's accumulated soul essence when killing a fellow human, while he received only a single shadow fragment. Or a few, at best, if the enemy was of the higher rank than him. Which hadn't happened yet, but was inevitably going to, considering his luck. The war against Tessai and Gemma must have been a true feast for changing star especially when slaying those experienced members of the host that had long saturated their cores themselves. She was always on the front line, after all. Fighting, killing, leading her followers. Sonny grimly stared into the darkness for a while, then slowly turned back to the runes. His eyes slid lower. Memories, Dream Blade, Starlight Legion Armor, Dawn Shard, Dark Wing, Nameless Sun, there were a few utility memories, too, including, Evertwine, the golden rope he knew so well but Sonny did not pay them a lot of attention. His sight was attracted to the Nameless Sun. What was that memory and why hadn't he seen or heard of it before? Memory, Nameless Sun. Memory Rank, Ascended. Memory Tier, Vi. Memory Type, Weapon. Memory Description. For a long time, the Nameless Sun suffered in solitude, longing for all the things that were lost. Only when she lost that longing, too, was the crimson terror of the Forgotten Shore finally born. His eyes narrowed. So, she received a memory after killing the vessel, after all, an ascended weapon of the sixth tier. Sonny wished that he could see its weave and learn what enchantments that terrible memory held. Whatever they were, however, the Nameless Sun was bound to be extremely powerful. But was it enough to help Nephis survive in the ruthless hellscape of the Dream Realm? He did not know. Frowning, Sonny continued to read the runes. Echoes, Attributes, Dreamspawn, Nephilim, Flame of Divinity, The Fire, Dreamspawn, Attribute Description, you are born of two worlds, belonging to both, but welcomed in neither. Your soul exists on the edge between nightmare and reality. Nephilim. Attribute description, there once were terrible creatures born of an unholy union between the divine and the profane. Nephilim were the most beautiful, and the most harrowing of them all. Flame of divinity. Attribute description, your soul is a flame with the light of divinity. The fire. Attribute description, you have inherited the lineage of sun god. He hesitated for a bit, studying Neph's attributes. So that's how it is. Sunny had always wondered what was her innate attribute, the one that was at the center of all the rest, the core of her being, just like his, faded, trait. He often thought that it was tied to drive, battle prowess, or will, but it was not. Instead, Neff's innate attribute was called, dream spawn, and tied to her nature as a child of a hollow mother. In a sense, she was connected to the dream realm, and the nightmare spell, from before she had even been born. Her core trait was duality. If his guess was correct, that duality was further expressed after Nephis had conquered her first nightmare and received her aspect, as well as a new attribute, Nephilim. Once again, it described a half-blood creature, half-divine, half-profane, half-deific, half-unknown. Suddenly, he remembered how Changing Star had stopped and stared at the depiction of a radiant being engraved into the walls of the ancient mine below the hollow mountains. Was that creature one of the Nephilim, or a fallen angel, from whom Nephilim were supposed to be born? After all, the similarity between that creature and her own powers was hard to deny. And then there was the last attribute, the fire. Sonny rubbed his face, a lineage attribute, somewhat similar to his own blood weave. Finally, the meaning behind that word became clear. Lineage memories akin to the, drop of Iker, were able to impart awaken with unique attributes that, unlike the usual ones, seemed to be hereditary. They could be passed down through a bloodline, and at least one of the great legacy clans, the almost destroyed immortal flame, possessed one. Did all great legacy clans, like Song or Valor, possessed one, too? Was that what allowed them to rise to the very top of humanity and claim their place as great clans, in the first place? Those bastards have so many secrets. 
Sonny also couldn't help but notice a slight difference between, blood weave, and, the fire. While the latter was described simply as lineage, the former was described as a forbidden lineage. What exactly made blood weave forbidden? Was it because it didn't come from a proper deity like Sun God, but from Mysterious Weaver, who was a demon? Had no one except for gods been allowed to leave behind a lineage? The blood weave was also described as a partial lineage, while the fire was not. Questions, questions. With a sigh, Sunny turned to the runes once again. Aspect, light bringer. Aspect rank, divine. Aspect description, you are a creature of light that was banished and doomed to exist in the darkness. You bring radiance and warmth to wherever you go, but with it comes indescribable longing. Aspect ability, soul flame. Ability description, your soul burns with the purest of flames. That flame can both restore and destroy, and is both a blessing and a curse. Innate ability, half-breed. Ability descriptions, you can directly absorb a portion of the soul essence of any nightmare creature destroyed by your flames, as well as of any human. Flaw, pristine soul. Flaw description, you must suffer to use your power. Sunny dismissed the runes and was motionless for a while, thinking, the name of the aspect, Lightbringer, could be translated in several ways. The first rune could mean both light and fire, and the second, meant either to bring or to bear, depending on context. So it could have been fire bearer as well, not that it made any difference. The rest he had already known or suspected, so it didn't surprise him much. Only the strange innate ability, Halbreed, was somewhat new. Nephis had mentioned once that she was capable of doing something like that, but without sharing any details. It was also funny that the name of her flaw was Pristine Soul, while his was Clear Conscience. What a pair they were, one lost from light, the other the source of it. One a master, the other a slave. He gritted his teeth and closed his eyes for a second. What else was there to note? The, soul conduit, attribute was gone. It seemed that the artificial sun or the crimson spire itself had sustained too much damage and collapsed, thus removing it. He had escaped just in time. I guess there's not a lot of secrets left between us now. Sonny was sure that there was a new rune that Nephis could summon, one reading slave. Just like he now had access to all the information about her, she was going to learn everything about him. The unique nature of his course, the shadow fragments, the true identity of the marble saint, the weaver's mask. She was going to know it all. That could potentially complicate. Before he could finish that thought, however, the spell spoke again, its voice filling the black void with melodious whispers. The second seal is broken. Awakening dormant powers. Oh, crap. I almost forgot. Sonny stared into the void with wide eyes. He was about to awaken. Just like after the first nightmare, Sonny suddenly sensed something waking up within him. Back then, it felt as though this new power came from inside his soul as opposed to some external source. This time the feeling was very similar, only more intense, more defined. It was coming from his shadow cores. They were radiating an ethereal, but almost palpable heat. The energy was circulating through his entire body, changing it, making it stronger. It was somewhat similar to the strange feeling he got every time he received a shadow fragment, but so much more powerful, a thousand times more powerful. And deeper, too. With a barely audible gasp, Sonny slowly sat down and crossed his legs, then closed his eyes, concentrating on the transformation. Every fiber of his being was soon full of the mysterious energy. The familiar euphoric feeling overwhelmed him, washing over his mind like a warm wave. However, Sonny wanted to feel more, understand more. He wanted to remember this moment in every detail. It was his triumph, after all. Beneath the physical changes that his body was undergoing to become better, stronger, more perfect. Was another, subtle, but equally incredible change. It was happening to his soul. Sonny had no words to describe it, but knew that he had never experienced anything as wonderful. The transformation of his soul was not at all painful, like the creation of the second shadow core had been, and not nearly as torturous as the agony that consuming a drop of divine blood had caused him. It felt natural, right, and profound, as though he was coming one step closer to becoming complete, to what he had always been meant to be, a better being. Soon, the pulsating waves of heat retreated, replaced by a wave of soothing coldness, the dull ache in his heart that had remained there, unnoticed, ever since leaving the forgotten shore lessened a little. His mind became calm and tranquil, Sonny felt like, like a sword that had been tempered and fortified in a fiery crucible, a being made of cold, pure, resilient steel. He exhaled slowly and opened his eyes. His body felt stronger, faster, and more enduring, similar to how he felt when wrapped in the shadow. The change was sufficiently pronounced, and he knew that it would only grow greater if he used one or both of the shadows to actually augment him. But it wasn't the main difference. Sonny knew that the actual quality that separated Awaken from the Dreamers was not physical might, but a new innate ability. Just like dreamers gain the ability to sense and interact with soul cores, 
The awakened could do the same with soul essence, but knowing and feeling were two different things. Before, he could vaguely feel his shadow core. The feeling was elusive and ethereal, but unmistakable. He felt its emptiness at the start of his journey, and felt it brimming with power near the end. Now, that power wasn't contained inside the shadow cores anymore, but broke free, flowing naturally through his entire body. It circulated slowly, coming and going from the cores, passively saturating his bones and muscles with power. Sonny instinctually felt that, with some practice, he would be able to direct the flow of shadow essence to concentrate it in a certain area. He could expend some amount of essence to give his arms incredible, explosive strength for a short amount of time, or feel his legs with the power to jump a dozen meters into the air. In short, it wasn't as though he had become monstrously strong and would be all the time, crashing through walls and breaking delicate things by accident. Instead, by wisely controlling his shadow essence, he would be able to gift himself short bursts of truly inhuman physical might. The rest of the time, he would enjoy a much smaller, but still considerable passive effect of his body being saturated with freely flowing essence. More training. Sonny could now control the shadow essence by instinct, but if he wanted to truly master it and do it more efficiently, he would have to learn from experienced awakened. Some instructors at the academy existed for the sole purpose of teaching newly awakened just that, after all. And then there was a whole another layer of combat strategy that he would have to understand and master. Sleepers thought much like mundane humans, only with more power and tools. But battles of the awakened were much more tactical. While essence always restored itself to the core's maximum capacity, it took time. In the reality of a battle, it was a finite resource. Because of it, one had to be smart and careful about how and when to use it. He would also have to absorb as many shadow fragments as possible to increase the capacity of his cores. Luckily, he now had two of them which already gave him a big advantage over the rest of the awakened. But this new amazing quality he had received was not the end of the awakening. The main event was yet to happen. The spell spoke again, filling him with anticipation. Awakening aspect ability. Aspect ability acquired. Aspect ability name, shadow step. Sunny blinked, then hurriedly summoned the runes. Name, sunless. True name, lost from light. Rank, awakened. Class, monster. Shadow cores, two sevenths. Shadow fragments. 0 2000. Just as expected, both of his cores were not dormant anymore, instead becoming awakened. The shadow fragments were consumed to fuel the awakening, bringing him to a stark and sad zero. A thousand fragments, gone just like that. He wasn't really disappointed, though. The amount of essence consumed during the awakening directly corresponded to the starting capacity of the core, and thus, the extent of the physical transformation that a sleeper would go through. By collecting a thousand fragments and fully saturating his first core, Sonny not only received a second one, but also made sure to gain the best benefits a sleeper could dream of. Very few awaken had ever fully saturated their cores before returning from their first journey to the dream realm, and now, Sonny was one of them. The difference was not drastic, but every little bit of power counted in a life and death situation. Enough stalling. Impatient, he banished the thoughts of cores and shadow fragments and found the description of his new aspect ability. Aspect Ability, Shadow Step. Ability Description, you can move freely between shadows, traveling from one to another in an instant. Looking at the shimmering runes, Sonny soon discovered that there was a stupid grin on his face. Teleportation. That's teleportation, right? That was, without a doubt, a form of teleportation. An ability such as this was a game changer. His mobility would become truly incredible. Not only would he be able to apply it to traversal, making his future ventures into the dream realm easier and safer, but it could also play a decisive role in a battle. What was more deadly than an assassin capable of appearing out of nowhere and disappearing from sight in a blink of an eye? Not many things, really. Of course, he would have to experiment and learn the true extent of this amazing ability. What was its range, for example? Would he be able to jump to any shadow in sight, or to any shadow in the range of a shadow sense? Did a shadow have to be deep and large enough for him to fit through, or would even the smallest and faintest of them do? And what about his own shadows? Would he be able to send one to a certain spot, and then step out of it, just like Saint usually did? He couldn't wait to learn. But before that, there were two other things he had to see. One was the new memory he acquired. The other one, and the one that filled him with nervous anticipation, was much more important. It was the relic he was supposed to receive for mastering the first step of the shadow dance. With a legacy relic in his hands and a lineage attribute coursing through his blood, Sonny would be theoretically eligible to create his own legacy clan. A great clan, even. Not that he was planning to. But before Sonny could glance at the corresponding runes, the spell suddenly whispered into his ear. Wake up, sunless. And instantly, the black void full of bright stars and silver light disappeared. On one of the underground levels of the academy hospital complex, 
In a small room that was filled with the massive rectangle of the dream pod and various pieces of medical equipment, a delicate girl with pale blonde hair was sleeping beneath the transparent glass lid, her face surrounded by wisps of cold vapor. Suddenly, a series of lights ignited on the surface of the pod, and the medical machinery in the room came to life, producing various noises. A few moments later, the girl opened her striking blue eyes and screamed. On a top floor of a private care facility in the center of a city, in a spacious room with tall windows and a luxurious interior, a state-off art sleeping pod stood silently, bathed in sunlight. An attending, nurse sat in a comfortable chair beside it, monitoring the vital signs of a beautiful young man who slumbered inside. For the past three years, there had not been a single minute when the young man was left alone. His pod was surrounded by fresh flowers, and someone was always there to keep watch. For three years, the flowers and nurses came and went, but the young man had remained the same. Nothing about him ever changed. Suddenly, the nurse opened her eyes wide. A second later, the sleeping pod shone with bright light. Its lid swiftly slid sideways and hid in a special housing slot. The figure inside was slowly raising in the air, as if pulled up by an invisible force. The beautiful young man was levitating. The nurse remained motionless for a few seconds, stunned. Then, she hastily ran to the panel on the wall and pressed a call button. In a small apartment in one of the less prestigious areas of the city, in a tiny room, a tall young woman was lying in an old and barely functioning pod. This one was possibly the last representative of its model, taken out of production a long time ago. Still, it seemed like the most luxurious thing in the apartment, by far. The door of the room was open, letting in the sound of a news broadcast. A pleasant and confident tone was currently saying, unusual number of awakenings. Dear viewers, we, we are currently receiving a report from our correspondents, and will be able to update you on this event shortly. The representatives of the great legacy clans, meanwhile, suddenly, the sound of the broadcast was cut out, replaced by a heavy, hopeless silence. Soon, the sound of tentative steps could be heard, approaching the room where the pod stood. Just a second later, however, a fist slammed into the armored glass of its lid from inside, sending a net of cracks through it. Back in the academy, in a room identical to the first one, the light suddenly blinked and then went out. It was now shrouded in absolute darkness. Something crashed down with a thunderous noise, and then, a pained human voice hissed. Damnation. A moment later, the lights came back, revealing the figure of a lithe young man with pale skin and dark hair standing near an overturned medical monitor. There was a disoriented, confused expression on his face. The lid of the sleeping pod was still closed. However, it was empty, and a few hundred meters away, hidden even deeper underground, there was another room. This one was slightly bigger, and much better guarded, than all the others. In it stood a simple sleeping pod. Beneath its transparent lid, a young woman with ivory skin and long silver hair slept, undisturbed by anything. Despite the growing commotion outside, inside the tranquil room, it was quiet and peaceful. Nothing changed. The pod did not shine with bright lights, the medical equipment remained silent. Imprisoned in the glass coffin of the sleeping pod, the young woman continued to dream, as if cursed to remain in her nightmares forever. Sonny looked around the small room, slowly realizing where he was. Academy. He was back at the academy. He had returned to the real world. He looked around, noticing the medical equipment and the sleeping pod, all of which were currently ablaze with the light of alarms. The pod was still closed. How the hell did I get out? Speaking of which, looking down, Sonny realized that he was naked. To avoid any awkward situations, he summoned the puppeteer's shroud. Once the armor weaved itself out of black strings and covered his skin, he felt a lot better. He did, however, have to force himself to not summon the midnight shard as well. His instincts screamed, demanding him to arm himself in an unfamiliar environment. But this was the real world. He had to adjust his behavior. The decision to cloth himself turned out to be the correct one. Just a few moments after he had made it, the door of the room opened, and a woman in a white coat rushed inside. Noticing Sonny, she froze. Her eyes widened in horror, and she raised a hand to cover her mouth, as if suppressing a scream. What's wrong with her? Sonny frowned, blinked a couple of times, then looked at his reflection in one of the medical machines. Dot 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 oh. Since both sleepers and awakened traveled to the dream realm in spirit, his actual body was whole and pristine, without even a single scar. However, the same could not be told about the puppeteer's shroud. The silk armor was torn and dirty, looking like rags. What's more, it was covered in so much blood that it was hard to tell that its fabric was once gray. Looking at the doctor in embarrassment, Sonny forced out a smile and said in a raspy voice of someone who had not spoken in more that year. Uh. Hi, can I maybe get some clean clothes? The woman stared at him for a few moments, then said in a trembling voice, Slee. Awaken sunless? Sir, you are awake? Sir. Did she just call me sir? Sonny grinned. 
I sure hope so. I've been sleeping for a year and two weeks, after all. The doctor finally seemed to relax and looked at him with a relieved, joyous expression in her eyes. A few moments later, she smiled slightly and said, her voice full of sincere admiration. Welcome back to the real world, sir. The hospital complex and the administration of the academy were in complete chaos today. Weeks following the winter solstice were always a busy time for all the people working on the periphery of the awakened society, since most of the sleepers who had ventured into the dream realm that year usually returned in a span of one to two weeks, very rarely a month. Those who had survived, of course, the sudden awakening of so many sleepers who had been gone for years, counted as irrevocably lost, created a shockwave that spread through entire humanity. And people at the academy were at the epicenter of that storm. It was a joyous chaos, nevertheless. In a small office at the surface level of the hospital, a young woman dressed in black slacks and a white blouse was sitting behind a desk, hastily compiling a short report. She had dark brown hair, neatly tied into a high ponytail, and thick glasses that were constantly sliding down her nose, forcing her to push them back up. The young woman was one of the administrative workers tasked with the initial debriefing of returning sleepers. As such, she had seen a lot of incredible things, and heard a lot of incredible stories. And, sadly, even more heartbreaking ones. But today was like no other day in her career. The sleepers that she was debriefing today were all anomalous, each and every one of them. The things they told her made her blood run cold, and her imagination fail. She even had an urge to dismiss their reports as false, but knew that it was nearly impossible. The lie detection technology built into the walls of the office would make lying very hard to pull off. Incredible. They are incredible, every single one of them. To survive for that long in a region of the dream realm completely cut off from the rest of the human territory, one populated by nightmare creatures much more powerful than any dreamer could ever become. The achievement of these brave young men and women was truly remarkable. It filled her with a sense of compassion, pride, and hope. Humanity received an unexpected, but wonderful gift today. Finishing the report and sending it to her superior, the young woman pressed a button to let the next sleeper know that it was their turn to come in. The door of her office opened, and a pale young man with dark hair entered the office. Because of the nature of her job, she was accustomed to interacting with incredibly attractive people. Almost every awaken was pleasant to look at, after all. The young man in front of her was far from being the most outstanding in terms of appearance among them. And yet, for some reason, she was unable to look away for a couple of moments, a natural smile somehow finding its way onto her face. There was something elusive about the young man that attracted attention, almost demanded it. He was of small height, with a delicate, slender build and perfect white skin. His dark eyes had a humorous, slightly mischievous spark in them. The young man wasn't exactly handsome, but due to his small stature, pale complexion, and dark hair, he looked like a beautiful porcelain doll. And there was a, a subtle strangeness about him. The young woman couldn't quite put it into words, but it seemed as though his every move, every word was ever so slightly not exactly how they should have been. Not really wrong, but also not completely right. This quality was equally as disturbing as it was magnetic. It was the reason why she couldn't stop paying him a bit more attention than to all the other sleepers she had interviewed today. The young man smiled and sat down opposite her. In response, her own smile widened a little. Good day, my name is Teddy, and I will be your interviewer today, awakened. Ah, of course, she already knew his name. His file was open on the screen in front of her, containing all the information the academy had on the pleasant young man. But it was important to create a friendly environment to allow the sleepers to relax. After their experiences in the dream realm, most were tense and on edge. Second to last place in the ranking. Poor kid, I can't even imagine what horrors he had to survive. The young man answered in a pleasant tone. Sunless. But people usually call me Sunny. So, ah, uh, awakened Sunny, I guess? No, that sounds weird. Just call me Sunny. Teddy nodded, then typed a few words on her pad. I will ask you a series of questions about your time in the dream realm. The purpose of this briefing is to enrich our base of knowledge about it, as well as let us know how to better assist you in the future. Any little bit of information you can provide might help future dreamers in their own trials, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to, of course. Awaken Sunless. Sunny. Nodded seriously. I understand. I promise to be honest and tell you only the truth. I am a very honest person. You see. Teddy smiled and asked the first question. How long have you spent in the dream realm? Sunny sighed. A year and a few weeks. Although, ah. Uh, it felt much longer. That matched the information in the file. This is so terrible. A whole year out there. She smiled with encouragement. I see. You did very well, Sunny. Very few dreamers had managed to survive for that long, especially in a region such as the... The Forgotten Shore, right? He shivered slightly before answering. Yeah. That's what we called it. Teddy typed a few more words. 
From the interviews with the other dreamers, we have confirmed that the region of the dream realm you were sent to is populated with nightmare creatures of the awakened rank and above. Can you confirm that information? The young man grew a little paler and nodded again. Yeah. Awakened, fallen, corrupted, too, although those only appeared at night. Teddy added a couple of lines to her report and asked. Have you participated in the battles against such nightmare creatures? If so, how many have you killed? Sonny was silent for a second, then raised his hand and began counting on his fingers with a thoughtful expression. Uh, three or four. She began to type and thought. Four awakened creatures. That poor kid looks so weak, and yet he managed to defeat four abominations much more powerful than him, despite being in second to last place of the ranking. Good job, Sonny. You are truly admirable. But Sonny didn't finish speaking. Hundreds. Teddy froze staring at the monitor. Excuse me? The young man thoughtfully scratched his chin and said. Yeah, I think that's right. Around 400. After a long and awkward silence, he asked. I am sorry, Teddy, is everything all right? She nodded slowly, then forced out a smile. Everything is fine, Sonny. I, I am sorry. We'll have to pause the interview now. He looked at her with sincere surprise and blinked a couple of times. Really? Why? She cleared her throat, then answered in a small voice. I'm, Afraid that I am not qualified to conduct this interview. My. My superior will be with you shortly, son. Awaken sunless. Please wait for a few minutes. Sunny sighed. Oh, well. All right. It's been nice to meet you. With that, he gave her a bright smile. Sunny left the office of the government agents in a strange mood. The conversation went exactly as he had planned. Even after a higher ranking specialist had been called in, he managed to steer the interview in the right direction, manipulating both answers and questions to achieve the desired result. In the end, he wanted everyone to know that he was someone exceptional. But not so exceptional as to overshadow the best of the best. Someone who was in the very highest tier of Young Awakened, but also at the very bottom of that tier. Even though he had kept his most outrageous accomplishments to himself, it felt weird to give away so many secrets about his skill, power level, and achievements. Sonny had grown so used to pretending to be a pathetic clown that removing that mask to reveal another, less outlandish mask was not easy for him. And yet, it was something he had to do. After he had awakened, there was not a single moment for him to properly think things through. He had to go through a series of medical and psychological tests, followed by a lengthy debriefing. However, he had been able to realize one thing very clearly. His situation had fundamentally changed. Now that his most important secret was revealed and Nephis had become his master, it was as though a crushing burden had been removed from his chest. Replaced by another, even more terrible weight. In any case, he could finally allow himself to relax a little. For a while, at least. Not because he trusted her that much, but because she was currently imprisoned in the dream realm, unable to enforce her control over him even if she wished to. In a sense, as far as his worst nightmare becoming reality went, this was the absolute best version of how things could happen. He had a lot of time time to think about countermeasures and prepare for whatever the future held, after all. Walking through the corridors of the hospital complex, Sonny was engrossed in thought. One thing he was sure about was that a divine shadow like him could only have one master. So, he didn't have to worry about someone else finding out his true name and enslaving him, not anymore. The guillotine blade that had hung above his neck all that time was now gone. However, he still kept the existence of his true name a secret, for one simple reason. He didn't know what was going to happen if Nephis died. Would he be free forever? Or die with her? He felt that neither of these theories was correct. Firstly because the description of the aspect described him as a divine shadow that had lost its master. Which probably meant that he could lose another one and remain alive. Secondly, because the runes of the shadow bond had become grey and lifeless, but did not disappear. Which meant that they might shine with ethereal light once again in the future. So, the most probable explanation was that he would be safe as long as Nephis remained alive, and if she was killed, anyone would be able to use the true name against him once again. A deep scowl appeared on his face. How long could anyone survive in the decimated remains of the forgotten shore? The dark sea was gone, but so was the sun. Most of the nightmare creatures were dead, but the strongest ones survived. It seemed that Changing Star had escaped the collapsing Crimson Spire, at least. What was she going to do now? Try to cross the hollow mountains to reach the human citadels? Or try her luck in the unexplored regions to the north, west, or east? What were the chances of her making it back to the real world alive? If it was anyone else, Sonny would say that the probability was zero. But it was Nephis, after all. For some reason, he was sure that she would survive, somehow. So, yes. Even though many things remained unclear, his situation had fundamentally changed. He was an awakened now, which meant that there were countless possibilities in front of him. To get access to the best opportunities and the most advantageous treatment, he needed one thing, 
Status. At this point, continuing to pretend to be a weakling would only be a hindrance. Sonny wanted to reap as many rewards as he could without putting himself at risk. That's why he shifted his usual pattern of behavior and gave the government agents enough information to paint himself as an exceptionally talented awakened. Not that he had a lot of choices. Sooner or later, people were going to learn at least some things about his time on the Forgotten Shore and see that a weakling simply would not have survived all that. Luckily, there was no shortage of exceptionally talented individuals who had awakened today. On any other day, Sonny's description of his prowess would have made a huge splash. But currently, he was just one of a hundred. Speaking of that hundred, turning a corner, Sonny suddenly found himself in the middle of a small crowd of people. Dozens and dozens of young men and women were standing in the middle of a small hall, most dressed in the simple training clothes provided by the hospital, just like he himself was. On their faces, there was an indescribable kaleidoscope of emotions, joy, sorrow, worry, anticipation. Most were looking at a small screen displaying a long list of names. These were the survivors of the Dreamer Army. Not everyone was here, of course. Some spent many years on the Forgotten Shore and had been transferred to other facilities by the government or their families. Sonny didn't see Sishan, Kai, or Effie, or Cassie. His face darkened. The absence of the first two made sense. Kai was probably being cared for in an expensive VIP care facility, while Sishan had to be kept in the stronghold of her clan. However, he had no idea where the other two were. Sonny hesitated for a moment, then looked at the list of names displayed on the screen. Before he could read anything, however, someone quickly approached and hugged him tightly. What the? Looking up, Sonny saw a vaguely familiar young man holding him in a passionate embrace. A moment later, the young man let go of him and looked down with glistening eyes. Sonny, you are here, too. Before he could even answer, a somber expression appeared on the young man's face. In a voice that trembled with emotion, he said, Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonny. If it wasn't for you and your shadow, we would have never made it to the gateway. At the sound of these words, the others turned around. As soon as they saw Sonny, bright smiles ignited on their faces. A hum of voices rose from the crowd. Guys, it's Sonny. Thank you, man. We will never forget what you did for us. Sonny stared at them, dumbfounded. Weird. This is so weird. Ever since he had come to his senses near the sleeping pod, mundane humans were treating him with the utmost respect. They even went so far as to use honorifics, calling him Sir or Awaken Sunless. And now this. Why was everyone so friendly and happy to see him? He had never experienced anything like this before. Was this what it was like, to be an Awakened? After dozens of young people came closer to shake his hand or happily pat him on the shoulder, he awkwardly smiled. Ah. It's nice to see you too, guys. The young woman who was currently facing him smiled in response. Then, however, her face turned dark. Have you heard anything about Lady Nephis after coming back? He stiffened, then shook his head. No. Have. Have you? She turned back to the screen, tears appearing in her eyes. Nothing. None of us did. Out of everyone who made it to the spire, only two are unaccounted for. She. We think she is still inside. Sonny remained silent for a while, then asked. Who is the second? The young woman sighed. Sir Castor. No one had seen him near the gateway. He must have gone to help her hold back the terror, and. And. Her voice trembled. Someone said that he died. Oh, gods. What if Lady Nephis dies, too? Sonny lingered for a few seconds, a grim expression on his face, then squeezed her shoulder lightly and quietly walked away. The hospital staff had provided each of the newly awakened with a small room at one of the underground levels of the complex, to have a place to rest and get accustomed to their new abilities while waiting for more permanent accommodations. If they were going to remain at the academy, of course. It was also a place they could take their families to talk and spend time together in privacy. Currently, many emotional reunions were taking place in similar rooms around Sunny's, made especially joyous and heartbreaking because the survivors of the Dreamer Army had spent long years on the Forgotten Shore. They had gone through hell, indeed, but their loved ones in the real world had suffered a great deal as well. Not that Sonny would know anything about that. No one had been waiting for him to return, after all. In any case, the room he had been provided with was sufficiently comfortable. There was an area for training, a desk with a pitcher of water and some snacks, a sofa, and even a bed. None of the returned were going to sleep, of course. Not for a few days, at least. At the very end of the field of shimmering runes, Sonny could now see a new string of symbols. Gateway, usually, the name of the gateway that an Awakened had last used would be written there. This was their anchor in the dream realm. Every time an Awakened fell asleep, they would be transported to the gateway they were anchored to, spend some time in the dream realm either as much as they wanted or as little as possible, only until their soul was ready to travel between worlds once again, and then go through that gateway to wake up back in reality. However, 
The gateway of the Forgotten Shore had been destroyed. For that reason, every single survivor of the Dreamer Army now had no anchor in the Dream Realm. That didn't mean that they would remain in the waking world forever, though, rather, it meant that they were going to be transported to a random one as soon as they fell asleep, just like during their first journey into the land of nightmares. The prospect of being at the mercy of the spell once more was nothing short of terrifying, especially for Sonny, who had the misfortune of always finding himself in only the most extreme of circumstances. However, the situation wasn't really that bad. There was a way for a newly awakened to change their anchor without relying on chance. It was to acquire the services of a saint, who would be able to take them to the dream realm without involving the spell, appearing near the saint's own anchor. Of course, that anchor would most likely be situated in one of the human citadels, allowing the awakened to anchor themselves to a gateway in human territory. There were just a few dozen saints alive across all of humanity, so for an average awakened, their help was not easy to get. However, Sonny was not an average awakened. In fact, none of the survivors of the Dreamer Army were. Every year, the most promising of the newly awakened were recruited by powerful citadels and provided the means to anchor themselves to their gateways. Everyone profited from this arrangement. The talented awakened received a chance to change their anchor if they wished to do so, while citadels received new powerful defenders or useful craftsmen to enhance their living conditions and infrastructure. With how extraordinary the hundred survivors of the Forgotten Shore were, and how unusual their circumstances turned out to be, there was going to be a small recruitment war happening in the next few days. Prosperous citadels were going to fight for the right to add these outstanding young people to their populations, promising better and bigger rewards, as if during an auction. The government would inevitably get involved, too, helping those who for some reason failed to find a citadel to call home. The survivors of the Dreamer army just had to remain awake long enough to make a choice and settle the details of their future anchors. Since their physique was far superior to that of mundane humans, they didn't have to sleep every day, so two or three were not going to be a problem. Sonny had a lot to do in these few days. The first thing he had turned his attention to after retreating to his personal room was test the limits of Shadow Step. The result of these tests left him pleasantly surprised. Just like he had suspected, the ability to travel between shadows was akin to a weird form of teleportation. He could enter a shadow that was large enough to encompass his body and instantly appear from another. The distance of that jump, however, was not too large. Currently, it was even smaller than the range of his shadow sense, around a dozen meters or so. However, he knew that it would increase as he absorbed more shadow fragments, just like the range of shadow control had increased back on the Forgotten Shore. There was an exclusion from that rule, too. He was able to travel between his own shadows no matter how far apart they were. By now, he could control his shadows from as much as a couple of kilometers away. That meant that, if both were sent into opposite directions and reached the limit of the shadow control range, he could potentially instantly cover about four kilometers of distance in less than a second. And that was just one side of Shadow Step. The other was, arguably, even more miraculous and unexpected. Before, Sonny could move through shadows as though he was one of them becoming practically undetectable. But now, he could literally become a part of the shadows, diving into them and becoming incorporeal. Not only did it make him completely undetectable by means of sight, hearing, and smell, but it also allowed him to move with incredible speed through any uninterrupted shadow, no matter how long and vast it was. In that state, he was invulnerable to physical attacks, but also unable to perform physical attacks of his own. It also felt very strange, sort of peaceful. Sonny had to constantly remind himself to concentrate and not forget what he was doing. That ability would become truly incredible at night or in the depths of some terrible cave system, like the one they had traveled through on their expedition to the Hollow Mountains. In short, Shadow Step was incredible. However, it came at a price. Unlike Shadow Control, which was as natural to Sonny as breathing, using Shadow Step required him to expend essence. The more distance he covered with a jump and the more time he spent as an incorporeal shadow, the more essence he would have to consume. Sonny suspected that the theoretical 4km jump would eat through all of his essence, leaving both of his cores dry as a desert. Spending essence was not the same as spending shadow fragments, of course. His soul always slowly generated essence, eventually filling his cores to their maximum capacity, while shadow fragments increased that maximum capacity and were used to create new cores, as well as turn echoes into shadows. Still, he also needed essence to fight effectively and use the more powerful enchantments of higher rank memories, so balancing its expenditure was an intricate task. Truly, becoming an awakened it opened a whole new layer of both incredible opportunities and insidious problems. It was a lot to take in, but he was going to get there, eventually. Sitting on the floor of his temporary quarters, Sonny sighed and summoned the runes. Finally, it was time to reap his reward. He had worked so much, and done so much, to get here. 
First, repeating the same sword strike thousands of times, day after day, until his hands bled and his muscles screamed from the pain. Learning the basic katas and movements of Neff's flowing battle style, then gaining enough insight into it to make it his own. Almost dying to receive the gift of clarity, then fighting against the shadow saint and slowly incorporating her grounded technique into his. Studying the movements of his shadow to catch the slight difference in how it held itself, then spending countless hours trying to decipher the hidden meaning behind it, until his mind was ready to boil. Solving that mystery and traveling into the past to observe the birth of the nameless temple slave, and the beautiful dance of his mother. And then, torturous practice and arduous process of turning his vision of the elusive and wonderful battle art into reality. Only to finally succeed in the middle of the furious, bloody battle against Nephis. Of all his achievements, this was perhaps the one he was proud of the most. Because Shadow Dance was entirely his. It was something he created out of almost nothing, something that bore and expressed his individuality. Sonny had never received any type of inheritance, so this legacy, which was created by himself and for himself, held a special place in his heart. Looking at the shimmering runes, he read, Aspect Legacy, Shadow Dance, Shadow Dance Mastery Level, 1 7th, 1st Relic, Claim, 2nd Relic, Unearned, 3rd Relic, Unearned, Holding his breath, he concentrated on the runes describing the first relic and whispered, Claim, as Sonny watched, the runes glowed brightly for a few seconds, and then changed, first relic, claimed, and a moment later, the spell spoke softly into his ear, you have received an aspect legacy relic, you have received a shadow, soul serpent. Sonny stared at the runes for a while, then slightly tilted his head, a shadow, what an unexpected boon, usually, a legacy relic came in the form of a memory, or very rarely an echo, perhaps there were some other types of relics out there, but he had never heard of them, that didn't mean much, though, by now, Sonny was reasonably certain that there were a lot of things that he, as well as the rest of mundane humans, had never heard about. Awaken kept a lot of secrets. Nevertheless, receiving a shadow pleasantly surprised him. Looking up, he saw new runes appearing out of thin air. Shadows, Marble Saint, Soul Serpent. Sonny hesitated for a few moments, then furtively looked around. The small room was empty and quiet. Feeling a little bit stupid, Sonny shook his head and summoned his new shadow to take a good look at it. A slight breeze moved his hair, and in the next second, nothing happened. Huh? Sonny frowned and looked around the room, then scratched the back of his head. What the hell? Where is the damn snake? He had hoped to see a giant serpent made out of shadows appear in front of him, with black scales as thick as plate armor and a mouth wide enough to swallow his enemies whole. Or an average-sized snake, at least. But there was nothing. He even checked to see if a new shadow joined his two invaluable helpers, but no. Both rested on the floor, one seemingly content, the other bored and in a perpetually bad mood. Weird. He raised a hand to rub his eyes but froze at the last moment. What is that? There was something dark on the skin of his wrist, peeking out slightly from beneath the sleeve. Following intuition, Sonny hastily stood up and took off the top of the training suit provided to him by the staff of the hospital complex. Left naked to the waist, he then looked at himself through the eyes of the shadow. Huh? Out there on his pale skin, an intricate image of a black serpent was tattooed, so detailed that it almost seemed alive. The serpent coiled around his arms and his torso, its tail resting just above his right hand, its head just above his left. What? I have. A tattoo now? In the darkness of the small room, the serpent almost seemed to move under his skin, two curved fangs threatening to break its surface. It was striking, beautiful, and disturbing. Of course, Sonny recognized the serpent immediately. Both the nameless temple slave and his mother had a very similar image marking their skin, after all. It was the shadow god's mark. But why did his new shadow turn into a tattoo? Confused, Sonny listened to his body and soul, trying to feel if something had changed about them. And soon, he did notice a small difference. The flow of the shadow essence through his body had changed. If previously it had circulated naturally, now, it seemed to follow the coils of the serpent, moving faster and with more intent, as if directed by them. Soul Serpent. Does that thing enhance my shadow essence control? To experiment, Sonny poured essence into his limbs and then performed several movements of shadow dance. After that, he jumped from one shadow to another a few times, expending even more essence. He felt the difference instantly. Not only was he able to control the essence better, but it also seemed to be consumed at a slightly slower pace, and restore it a faster one. Soul Serpent served as a channel for it, existing both on the material and the spiritual plane. As such, it was connected both to his cores and to his body, creating a strange bridge that allowed Sonny to use his shadow essence with better efficiency. This is a very useful shadow. 
Those words were an egregious understatement. Sonny had already understood how important and vital managing essence was for the awakened. Any tool that could enhance that aspect of their power was truly precious. And he got such a marvelous one, practically for free. He was also sure that the serpent would only get more powerful in the future, provided he kept it well fed, of course. But how was he supposed to feed memories to a tattoo? Perplexed, Sonny thought for a bit, then finally concentrated on the runes once again. Shadow, Soul Serpent. Shadow Rank, Dormant. Shadow Class, Monster. Shadow Attributes, Shadow Guide, Soul Weapon. Shadow Description, When the End Came, Shadow was the last of the gods to be destroyed. Many have resented him for creating death, but in the end, death embraced all. Noting the interesting detail of a connection between Shadow God and death, Sonny lowered his gaze. However, the last string, the one he had been accustomed to paying the most attention to when it came to Saint, was missing. There was no indication of how many shadow fragments it would take to make the serpent evolve. Sonny frowned. Come to think of it, that strange shadow was clearly connected to his soul. Perhaps it wasn't a coincidence that it was a monster. Sonny was a monster himself, after all. So, maybe, the serpent would not evolve its class like Saint had, by consuming the soul core of a suitable nightmare creature. Most likely, it would grow alongside Sonny himself. But why was it of the dormant rank, while Sonny had already become an awakened? Huh, maybe. Maybe its rank was not tied to Sonny's soul, but to his comprehension of the shadow dance? Currently, he had mastered only the first of the seven steps of the battle art, and the serpent belonged to the first of the seven ranks. Would it evolve to a higher rank if he mastered more steps? Full of thoughts, Sonny sighed and turned his attention to the shadow's attributes. Shadow Guide. Attribute Description. Soul Serpent guides shadow essence as it flows through your body. Soul Weapon. Attribute Description. Soul Serpent can assume the form of a weapon. The form of a Wii. Wait, what? Sonny blinked a couple of times, then stared at his left wrist, where the head of the Soul Serpent was drawn under his skin. Its scales were so intricate that it almost seemed as if the creature was moving. Now. It really was moving. Following Sonny's mental command, the Soul Serpent slithered up to his hand, and then escaped from it, turning into a dark blade. As the coils moved across his body, the blade grew longer and longer, until a hilt wrapped in black leather rested comfortably in his grip. The tattoo was gone. Sonny found himself holding a lusterless greatsword. It was a menacing, formidable, foreboding Odichi. Including the hilt, the Odichi was as long as he was tall. It was surprisingly light for its length, but heavy enough to inflict truly devastating wounds. Almost invisible on the dark steel, a lifelike image of a coiling serpent was etched into its blade. He weighed the great sword in his hands for a while, then smiled darkly. Dot 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 truly, this is a weapon worthy of a shadow. It was still weak, though. If it was a memory, it would have been only a dormant one of the second tier. Sonny was going to have to put in some work to make the dark Odichi really fearsome. With a sigh, he commanded the serpent to slither back onto his body, and then to disappear entirely. A few seconds later, his skin was clean and empty once again. What a bountiful harvest I had today. Sonny stared at the darkness for a few minutes, then sighed heavily. It was time to do something that he had dreaded doing ever since returning to the real world. He couldn't put it off any longer. In a heavily guarded underground room, a young woman with silver hair was sleeping in a transparent machine that kept her body alive. Her face was pale and thin, painted by the ghostly glow of machine lights and deep, angular shadows. The room was peaceful and silent, the hum of machinery creating low background noise. From time to time, a piece of medical equipment produced a sound and grew quiet again. A blind girl with piercing blue eyes stood quietly near the sleeping pod, an empty expression written in the delicate lines of her beautiful face. If it wasn't for the fact that her hand rested on the hilt of an elegant rapier, a person would easily mistake her for one of the hollows that were cared for on another level of the hospital complex. The door of the room did not open, however, there was suddenly another presence inside. A young man with pale skin and dark, cruel eyes appeared out of the shadows and walked over to stand on the opposite side of the sleeping pod. His steps were soft and quiet. He lingered for a while, then looked down, at the young woman sleeping beneath the glass lid of the mechanical coffin. For a second, his face became contorted by a terrible grimace. Grief, anger, fear, and longing mixed in his eyes, then disappeared, hidden behind a mask of cold indifference. Sonny stared at Nephis for a long time, trying to get his emotions under control. He knew that seeing her like this, weak and helpless, would affect him, but he didn't know just how much it was going hurt him. He also had not anticipated how dark the thoughts entering his mind would be. I can kill her right now. One strike of the moonlight shard, and I'll be free again. But no, he couldn't. Firstly, because there was no guarantee that Nephis would die if her body was destroyed. Just like there were hollows, people whose souls had been destroyed while leaving an empty body behind, there were lost, 
people whose bodies in the real world had died, leaving their souls wandering the dream realm. He suspected that this was the reason why the people who wanted changing star dead had sent Castor to kill her in the dream realm instead of infiltrating the academy. And secondly, and maybe more importantly, he simply could not bring himself to harm Nephis. Not again, not anymore, and not. Not like this. Cassie, on the other hand, with a dark grimace, Sonny slowly moved his gaze to the blind girl. As if noticing it, she turned slightly and said, Hello, Sonny. He stared at her, his eyes burning with fury. What? You can see now. Cassie lingered for a moment, then shook her head. No. But. Something like that. A wild grin appeared on his face. Congratulations. Really, good for you. You won't be useless anymore, at least. He knew that his words were going to hurt her, and was glad to say them for that reason. The blind girl didn't react, and just continued staring into the emptiness, her eyes cold and distant. But he wasn't fooled. He knew her well enough to recognize the ocean of pain hiding behind the coldness. Good. Suffer. You deserve this. Sonny opened his mouth, wishing to accuse her, but then forced himself to stop. He had to keep himself under control. Swallowing his angry words, Sonny gritted his teeth and spat. How? How did you even know? Cassie hesitated for a bit, then answered quietly. When you killed that spy from the castle. You said it out loud then. I saw it. In a vision. After that, the rest was not impossible to figure out. His eyes widened. Sonny remained silent for a long time trying to deal with the shock that her words had caused him. Harper. When I killed Harper, the memory of that horrible day sent a shudder through his soul. He remembered it so vividly. The blood streaming down his hands as he held the pitiful young man down, murdering him, giving in to the agony of the flaw, and whispering in a hoarse, barely audible voice, lost from light, I am. Lost, lost from light, standing in the underground room of the hospital complex, Sonny wanted to both laugh and cry. So this is it. This was what did me in. One mistake, I only made one mistake, and it was all it took to undo me. It was almost as if Harper had managed to avenge himself from beyond the grave. Well, he had never gotten a grave, really. Sonny just dumped his body in the ruins, for the nightmare creatures to feast on. A lot of good it did him, in the end. Piercing the blind girl with a burning look, he said through gritted teeth. So that was why you were waiting for me back then, why you gave me the eternal spring. You were. You were ready to say goodbye, you knew? Cassie slowly faced him, then said in a steady, even tone, Yes. I did. Sonny looked down, clenching his fists. You knew. If you knew. Then why didn't you try to change anything? Why, curse you. Cassie stared at him, her calm expression finally collapsing. Pain, sorrow, and anger contorted her face, and with a voice so hurt that it almost sounded as if she was bleeding, she answered. Didn't try? Of course, I tried. I tried everything I could to make the future I saw change. But no matter how much I tried, it never did. It always remained the same. Even worse, my attempts only made it appear even more inevitable. Turning away, she gritted her teeth and remained silent for a while, her hands trembling. I, I, I was the first one to understand what my vision of the Crimson Spire meant. Shadows devouring a dying angel. I understood it on that very day. Cassie closed her eyes for a moment, then spoke again, her voice quiet. Don't you remember? I even asked you to promise to always protect her. And what did you say? Sonny stared at her, remembering. Yes, at the very start, there had been a conversation like that. No. I said no. A fragile smile appeared on Cassie's face. Yes. You said no. And on that day, I knew that I had to make a choice. And I made it. I chose Neff. She shivered and hugged herself, as if dying of cold. I had to betray one of my best friends to save the other. And I did. I chose to sacrifice you to save Neff. Of course, I fooled myself for a while telling myself that nothing bad would happen. That if I help Neff, maybe both of you would survive. But deep down, I knew that it was just one of the possible outcomes. So what was the difference? I betrayed you. And you know what? A small, bitter laugh escaped from her lips. It was for nothing. I betrayed my best friend, and nothing still changed. I sacrificed you, but couldn't save anyone. Despite it all, I couldn't. Couldn't change fate. Sonny stared at her for a while, then snarled. That's it? That's your speech? That's what you have to say for yourself? What do you want me to do? Pity you. A furious gleam appeared in his eyes. After everything I have done for you, after I saved your life countless times, took care of you as if you were my sister, this is how you chose to repay me? By giving my biggest secret to Neff, so that she could use it against me when the time came? Cassie remained silent, not saying anything. Do you even know what you've done? Do you even know what you've taken from me? She hesitated for a bit, that answered quietly. I didn't know why, or how my vision would come true. I only knew that it would happen in the spire. 
So I gave your secret to Nephis, hoping that she would survive, thanks to it. Sunny laughed, then grew quiet. An oppressive silence settled between them, and remained unbroken for several minutes. After a while, he finally said. I can understand. Rationally, I do. You were forced to make a terrible decision, with both choices being a betrayal, and you chose to help Neff, who was with you first, who saved you when I would have just left you to die. But then, a cold gleam appeared in his eyes. But that doesn't mean that I can forgive it. You go to hell, Cassie. Go to hell and die there, for all I care. I hope that I will never see you again. With that, Sonny turned around to leave, but then stopped. He couldn't help but be cruel to her one last time. Oh, and that secret? It was the reason why she got stuck there all alone. So, in a sense, you have doomed both of your friends. As he spoke those words, Cassie flinched. A satisfied, vindictive smile appeared on Sonny's face. But why did it hurt him so much to say those words? So, congratulations. You've made it back, Cassie. Go back home, spend time with your family. Didn't you tell me that your mother makes the best eggs? Eat your fill. Try to enjoy them, knowing what you did. As the blind girl paled and turned away with a broken expression on his face, he smiled bitterly and dissolved into the shadows. Bonds of friendship were such a fragile thing. They were so hard to create, but so easy to break. All it took was a moment. 